have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale. We are back. The boys are back. It's season four of Cinema Royale 2016. Holy moly. It's been a long four weeks, but we're back. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. I said the boys are back in town. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyways, we're back with a new season of episodes, and uh, let me introduce you to my awesome bros of cinema, the brotherhood of cinema here. First up is Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. How do you do? What? <laughs> my natural voice. Uh, sure. <laughs> Your natural voice. So this is why every time before you go to do a recording for animation, look back, you always drink way too much coffee. Wait, wait. I don't drink coffee. I think I think I can explain that one. <clears throat> Oh man, I guess I better take my little gummy rice right here, otherwise I'm gonna sound like a dweeb. Uh, let's get in the city position. <laughs> Whoa. Shaft. And the man in the middle is Morgan Ledger. Let me just start by saying 2015 was a pretty big year. A lot of good things, but mostly a lot of losses. I was one of those losses. The good thing about 2016 is a big game for the show. Me! Mm -hmm. Wait, when you were wait, you were lost in 2015, so you a ghost? It was never confirmed. Oh no. <laughs> Last but not least is James Sullivan, also known as Hamitude. And <coughs> Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by... Akum? You know, it isn't Star Wars unless shit goes down on a catwalk with no railings. Yep. yep. Spoiler alert, I nearly left the theater and I saw... Hold on a second, I need to make this joke work because some people haven't seen this movie. See this movie already? Spoiler alert, I almost left the theater when I saw... <laughs> shot. Yep. Yes. Yes, there could be a lot. So, before we go on, I will say there's going to be a lot of spoilers for any movies you have not seen of 2015. Yes, we're going to talk about films of 2015. There's going to be a retrospective of 2015. We've seen a lot of films. We narrowed it down to eight categories. We'll go through the categories. And mind you, we have not seen all the films of 2015. So, if we missed the film, we're sorry. And but, also, on another note, some lists might not be similar. Some lists might be different. So yep. I'm just going to say out of the way, it was hard to find a good spot for Star Wars and Jurassic Park. Star Wars, that was a good movie. Not a great movie. I have a huge, huge crush for Jurassic World, but powers that be and mixed reactions I decided to go against and not put them on my um, choosing list. So, no. just... Hey, I want to be fair to the fans, alright? I love Oh yeah, Jurassic I forgot to put those on my list. <laughs> Oh, look at that! There's dun, two. Dun. I didn't put I didn't put Star Wars or Dress War on my list either. Wow. We're gonna wow. Get so, we're gonna get so many letters. We're, we're gonna get so many people saying, "What the fuck's the matter with you?" Please. Yeah, I might I might even get some letters too. Literally. Please, please send your complaints to projectorboothrequest at gmail dot com. Thank you very much. I, I, All right. Though, to be fair, I liked Dress World more than Star Wars. Okay. I like it. Right. I can see that. Hey, it had a T Rex fighting a mule velociraptor. <laughs> yeah, that's that awesome. Fun. Yeah, choreographed by WWE. <laughs> but no, I, I wanted to be fair, so I didn't put those two in here. Yeah. So, and it's fighting the Velociraptor! Yo, I'm the raptor, beating everything that I can. I'm gonna kill everything to the dawn of man. Yo, you'll see me when I'm with the soil. I'll be back, back but I'm coming, I'm coming as, as oil. oil. <laughs> <laughs> so, like I said, we got eight categories for the 
for the film. Some have one, some have two, depending on the person. We don't know each other's list, so this is going to be a surprise for all of us once we go around the table. So first topic I, is uh, the biggest disappointment of 2015. Disapp so we got hyped up for the movie, we saw the film, and we got disappointed by it. Alright, so I'm okay. first? Yeah, you go first. Yeah, it was hard for me to find something, like, I came in thinking to expect, like, good things out of it, but then it, I didn't, it didn't come out to my expectations, but there was one that did pop out of my mind. It was something that I liked, but it didn't come out as good as I, would, I thought it would, and I went with Tomorrowland. No, I didn't like. I did have a long thought in hearing other people's thoughts about it, and I feel like I did like it, but more as a Disney fan because it did throw. It did do a lot of throwbacks to many Disney references, from Space Mountain to audio animatronics to the 1964 World's Fair. It's a small world, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's so, the only like, good part about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like, I adored. <laughs> the begin like I adored the opening, like when we see like George Clooney Jr. in the 1964 World's Fair and then first entering into Tomorrowland. I, I thought it was like Brad Bird level level of goal of good. Mm -hmm. But then everything kind of went south afterwards. And here are like here's some of the reasons why. It's just that um the biggest problem is that the moral is pushed way too hard. It really isn't subtle. Like I like the more I like the moral that it's trying to say, but honestly, like it's hammered down way too freaking hard. And because like they try to focus on that, I feel like the story is a little it's it's pretty predictable with some cliches in the way. So that can be also an issue and um like there are a few characters that are likable, like George Clooney's character and uh, uh, the robot girl. I forgot her. Oh, yeah. Um, Athena, I believe. Athena. Her. Athena. Yeah. But yeah, then, like, Athena. the main girl, eh, I feel like she's she, she's too generic for this kind of story, like the, op like the optimistic kind of girl. It's like it's too obvious for that kind of character to be in this. So, like, yeah, this is – it's – like – even though I still liked it in the end, it, I definitely do agree with everyone that this is definitely Brad Bird's weakest work. Like, he could have done a lot better with this. But, again, I, I, I feel like maybe maybe the, the problem is that they got the guy who also wrote Lost, David Lindelof, involved. So, like, that could be an issue. Like, it, without him, maybe Brad Bird would have done something a lot better, but... Honestly, yeah, like it's okay, but yeah, it didn't come out as well as uh, I hoped it would. Mm. Yeah, Tomorrowland is one of. You know, I was like, I was kind of high, having high expectations for it. I was like, it's a good concept, Brad Bird. Come on, Brad Bird for fuck's sake! But um, I watched it with James, and oh my god, oh my god, it, the concept's there. It just the the writing. It was the script. The writing was not. It was good at most parts. Sometimes the story was like lacking, and it was, sometimes it didn't explain until at the end of the movie. And it was just it's all over the place. And it's, it's a good thing I have two choices for this category because ironically and not surprisingly, I actually picked Tomorrowland for biggest disappointment as well. There were only three things I liked in this film: uh, crotchety George Clooney shouting at kids. <laughs> Oh yeah. The Android Athena and Yeah, I actually think it was just those two things, but I think now, about didn't it. you also say you like the uh the the, the battle the fight the wall? Yes, the yes, the, the, the scene the of the house. house yes, the scene of the yeah. house they have all the booby traps and stuff. All that's missing is just Daniel Stern and a robot version of Joe Pinch, you can just see them running around the house. Yep. <laughs> Shut up, Mom. Um, but for me personally it was I gotta fun. get your clothing <laughs> but for me it was more than just um, the extreme of the message. It was the lengths they were pushing it to. The fact that you have to rely on optimism in order to get through every day to get to the future and stuff. I thought they were really pushing it way too hard, especially for a film like this. And then we get this big reveal at the end, where as it turns out, evil conglomerate, um, 
Huey lore is like sending out negative messages to like shock people into thinking the future is going to be evil and stuff. And oh, they hit it up like a big chocolate no, it's, it's like the End of the world. It's not yeah. like the world is evil. It's the, like the, the big apocalypse. apocalypse. Yeah, the big apocalypse or something. And that really bugged me because here you have this very Grinch like character who's literally saying, hey, you want to think it like this? Okay, I'm going to close the door on you. I'm going to keep this whole damn place to myself. And I felt like, okay, I would have been fine with that movie if they had, like, a change of heart scenario. I can put up with the weird, generic, optimistic character who's a rebel, even though those two things don't add up. I can be okay with, like, the weird narrative structure. I can be okay with certain things. But I was so dull and annoyed that when we get to that last third, I felt it went straight off the rails. Instead, it becomes a weird good versus evil ploy. Uh, the villain gets killed instead of reprimanded, like in previous Brad Bird works, with the exception of The Incredibles, but you can have you know, reason behind that one. I, I just felt like this film was a big waste, and even though it's trying to do this message of like, okay, be thoughtful, think happy, look, you can't have joy without the sadness. And I really felt like it just didn't work because it was just hammering it in too far and every time I tried to prove that message of saying, be good in the future, be good, I just sort of sat there going, so what? I'm done with Utopia films. Yeah, and just to... I, I When I was watching the film, I had... I had my my own comparisons to make. I think um, it when I was what I was getting here was um, if for for starters, it's not Tomorrowland; it's alternate dimension land. I was gonna say that looks yeah. like tomorrow, which is not what yeah. which which was not what Walt Disney intended. But hey, because it because. Disney's intention initially was it was the future world of 1983 or something like that. Well, Actually, a lot of people make comparisons like they didn't see this as Tomorrowland itself, but there are some Disney fans who made allegories that this is not really Walt Disney's version of Tomorrowland, but like this is kind of like the film adaptation of the Epcot that we didn't have that's like Walt Disney's original vision. Yeah then it's still kind of screwed up. But anyway, and, and even uh, my point being, sorry. I was just about to say, another thing that really bugged me was the purpose of Tomorrowland. Why does it exist? One minute it's open for inventors with big ideas that need to be matured, then one minute it's a vacation resort, and then one minute it serves as a home for people. I was really confused. There was no per uh, motive or purpose behind it. I felt mm -hmm. there, there shouldn't have been. It was just way too complex. Like, okay, we have to go into one tunnel to get to the Eiffel Tower. There's a rocket inside the Eiffel Tower to go into Tomorrowland. I think there could have been a much more simple clever idea. This movie tries to make it yeah. too big and complex. It should have been simple and sweet. The reason why I'm... What, what I'm trying to say here is... Uh, with the way that... With the way that this this film is set up, you got you got a story where all the all the creative people are disappearing off into this into this uh, alternate dimension, where they can do all these amazing things. Um, it kind of reminded me, in a sense, of the story of the story Atlas Shrugged, only where in that in that uh, story all the the brilliant minds of the world keep disappearing, and it turns out eventually they all went to form their own country somewhere else. And because the the old world, the world that we know, is is supposedly no no longer fit for them, or no longer welcoming of their brilliance, this that at least I could understand as a concept. With this movie, they there's no there's no reason for them to to go to this to go to this alternate dimension in the first place and at, hey you know what at least in atlas shrugged all the brilliant people didn't say hey let's create a machine that's going to make the old world want to blow itself up because you and i just want to add one more thing before we move on um Surprisingly and really enjoy this movie so much, he put it at number one at his top ten list of best 2015, even to the point where he was part of an association of film critics in a certain northern region territory, which I won't 
say or mentioned, but I think Matt lives in it or near it. Um, Alaska? Close enough. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say his name either way. Um, no. I, I, looked at the, it was, I looked at the list of the critics in that ring that voted for their, that submitted their top ten list of best films and stuff like that. He was the only one that had Tomorrowland on his list. Everyone else is like Mad Max, Fury Road, Jurassic World, da 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 da. I want to say that's courageous, but I find that very sad. He's the only person defending this movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sa Santa Claus usually has bad decisions for his movies, anyways. So. <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. Touche. Well, actually, my yeah. my choice for the most disappointing. Was not uh, was was not Tomorrowland, believe it or not. What? After this, after this, what? After this, see, I knew, I knew, I knew this is where thing was going to happen. My, uh, and that's why I I let everyone you know say as much time uh, that they did because you know we got we got time. Uh, my biggest mm -hmm. disappointment of the year, at the end of it all, is still. Still Terminator Genesis. Oh yeah, that's oh, a god. thing. Oh god. Yes. It it and then and <laughs> we already went through all the reasons why, or at least I did yes. and, and Morgan and, and Matt and a previous but, see, now, now, here, but the now, now, now here's the thing. At the time we talked about it, I didn't see it yet, so I couldn't defend it, but now that I've seen it, it's actually on my list as a guilty pleasure. Oh, oh! You'll Spoiler be able to. Alert. You'll be able to defend that when the time comes, sir. I saw the trailer. Does that count of me seeing the movie? Yes. There you go. Okay. <laughs> basically, basically, I haven't missed much. You seen the trailer? You seen the movie? There's yeah. No, okay. I saw the trailer, so I can get my thoughts on it. All right, James Bond. Okay. It's plan. Then why is it a disappointment? Well, I uh, I already gave all the reasons in the previous. In in the previous uh, podcast, we you know it it's it it's such a it's such a, an insult to the characters in the in the in the the franchise that it came from, just to make just to keep just to keep uh, a hold on this franchise, but the but the one the one thing fresh that I want to bring up here that I don't think we brought up was how much James Cameron actually was a fanboy of the film despite all the criticisms despite everything he uh he remembers sitting in the in the theater and just sort of saying oh man i was on for this ride and whatnot and morgan and i were, were talking about it afterward and we said and, and i think morgan you said uh, i'll bet somebody paid him to say that yes yeah i remember that <laughs> um it's it's funny because looking back at Terminator Genesis, it sort of makes you wonder what they're going to do with the franchise of the whole series as a whole. Um, it's like okay, they wanted to go somewhere. They got the stepping stone. They want to do sort of this Marvel Cinematic Universe thing with this whole different dimensions, which they do in the post credit scene. This movie mm -hmm. only had action scenes, and that was really about it. Just action scenes. The time travel is so stupid that it makes you actually think the time travel and dimension jumping in Rick and Morty is more plausible, and that that science really is. The, the things with the characters are one known generic. Poor Arnold. Every time he appeared with that white hair, I kept thinking of fat grandma beefed out and stuff. Yeah, the... I, I, I was, uh... You did it, you did it, it might as <laughs> A slap on well. the mouth! Put that cookie down, or you'll get one right across the lips! You've been ditching too much of that cinema scrooge! <laughs> You're gonna get caught up the ass! And mumble gaze down your nostrils if you don't put the chocolate chip down on the plate, boy! I think, uh... I think it would actually be a good. Uh, it it would have just made as much sense for uh, for Kyle Reese to travel back in time 
and end up in the in the realm of the Gazorpazorps. That would have made a more confusing <laughs> film, but it would not be. But it would not. It would not be Terminator. <laughs> yeah, and also I just wanted to add that you know thinking about it now, like there are a lot of moments that feel like so out of character that it doesn't make any sense. Like thinking of the big plot twist that John, uh, John Car, yeah, no John. John Connor. John Connor. I was about to say John Carter. Um, that John Connor ends up being a, a T-1000 himself in order to save his life or something like that. It just, I feel like it makes no sense. Like, is this some kind of alternate universe John Carter, John Connor or something like that? I'll explain. What happens is Doctor Who comes in from older dimension, turns out he's a cyborg, mutates with John Connor. So John Connor is now a half-human half -human and John Connor's like, oh, I'm half human, half robot. That means I can live and survive and stuff. Look, Ma, I'm a machine. Yeah, and it's it legitimately what he does. That just makes no sense, considering the dude is like the ultimate, like, he's the ultimate guy who is against the the machine. Why does he want to be one of them? <laughs> makes no sense. It's like a co it's like a common human being. Who, who wants to go and vote for Donald Trump? And then, sorry, and sorry then, for this. So, like. and, then, and then another thing disappointing. You know you're watching a PG-13 movie where every nude shot has a black masking against it. So instead of seeing Donald's 1980s digitally made ham and eggs, but you just see like a black streak against it. Oh, do they do like those like, power covers? No, worse, worse. They had like this little black spot around his ass. So, really? Yeah, yeah. When he's watching, he's like this black shadow across his ass. It was so disappointing. It's like I remember watching the first one, thinking, "Wow, this shot is great. He's so powerful. He's naked. He doesn't give a shit." In this one, it's like, oh, this is it. Yeah, why not? Like, if they're gonna, if they're gonna censor it, not so creative. Like, just have a big Skynet logo covering his back. I know I don't want to raise questions, but that has some masterpiece. <laughs> it belongs, it belongs on the Oscar statue. It belongs in a museum. <laughs> I can imagine you just see the Oscar statue, you turn it around, you just see this giant, weird, muscly bubble butt. Still, five points for censoring uh, Kyle Reese's career. I'll give him that much. Too flabby for enjoyability, I guess. Made you no. say it. Anyway. Yes! Oh, oh god! Oh, god. Oh, this back, Mike. oh, this is gonna be fun now! Oh, wait till you hear my discussion about that later on. We'll put a pin in there. Okay. Next category, because <clears throat> my pick was also Tomorrowland, he picked Tomorrowland, so... Oh, actually, I said I had a second choice, because I had, like, two... What was it? Oh, for... What was your second choice? Surprise, well, surprise, Q surprise, it wasn't just Tomorrowland. There was another film this year which disappointed me. There was so much talk, there was so much great critical... No, not critical is the wrong term for it. There was so much media buzz around this one that I felt, okay, I might as well see what everyone's talking about. So on Valentine's Day, I saw Fifty Shades of Grey. The reports. Oh, it's so controversial. Oh, it's so big. Oh, it's so offensive. Oh, over in the Philippines, it's being censored because it's so shocking and everything. No, it's not shocking. It's stupid. The characters are one note. It's not interesting. When they explain sexual terms like dominant and sub uh, sub subordinate, they explain it like as if we're kids. Seriously, there's this whole scene where um, Anastasia is her name. Yeah, Anastasia mm -hmm. is like getting this contract to be his sub or something like that. You know, the, 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 getting all the sexual pleasures and stuff. And she reads it and she sees all these terms and the terms being explained like as if they're being explained to a preschooler. That is how this? stupid this movie is. We think we're that dumb to not know what sex is. If those writers were adapting this novel, I would say, go watch Blue Velvet. 
Cause All right, little Billy, this goes here. That's exactly what this movie's doing. It's saying they think sex is just something that we don't understand, unconditional love and all that sort of stuff. And it's bad enough when your two leads are not romantically interesting and have this dead cold pan stare. It's bad enough alone when the only good thing about the movie is landscape porn. Like there's a scene where they're up in a helicopter and these shots from the city landscape look, which look actually pretty nice. And it's bad enough when the sex is not sexy enough to make it even more interesting. Even people where I work, they say the movie is not that good either. <laughs> So, I walked out of it, I was like, eh, this was lame. And even then, when, when the movie was over, and you get that cliffhanger where she leaves him, and she goes in the elevator, and the doors close, and the credits roll, I'm not kidding. I had, like, audience members, like, in the teen college years. The minute that ending happened, I heard the following shout. What? You gotta be kidding me! That's how it ends! I ain't reading the fucking books! What? what? Legit! There was these youngsters yelling at the screen in agony. They're like, it can't end this way. Oh please! <laughs> oh god! Like I said, if you want to do a movie exploring dark desires of humanity, there's better. His name's David Lynch. I can see a movie being made here about stalkery, interest, love, which we call it bars, or again, stuff about dark desires, but the problem is, it's been done better, and this movie is no better than anything. Okay, I actually have one question throughout this whole thing. Now, your criticisms are really legit. Why the fridge is this in your biggest disappointments? Did you actually have to hope for Fifty Shades of Grey? I heard the reports. I heard that this was, like, so super controversial and everything. It's another movie, like, last, uh, the, the Passion of the Christ, or, uh, or, 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 I don't know. Bad Santa. Yeah. The well, end yeah, the interview, Silent Night, Deadly Night, movies that are so hyped up because they have such a controversial idea, and then you sit down and you're like, oh, they're making a big stink because of this? Really? It's that kind of feeling. It was like, okay, why is everyone making such a big buzz about this? If it because offends me... a popular freaking book adapted into a popular movie. That's it. And that's why it was a disappointment, because at the very least I expected a glimmer of hope in there, even though I knew it was going to be stupid. <sighs> Okay. okay, that makes sense now, sort of. <laughs> next category, please. But... <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so the next category is uh, the pleasant surprise. Surprise, motherfucker! I honestly have to go with the SpongeBob movie, Sponge Out of Water. Now, for the longest time, I keep hearing about how SpongeBob nowadays is really not get that good. It has pa way past its prime. And then I decided to go, like, I went and checked out this movie, and I even got an advanced screening of this, which, which was really cool. And I decided, you know, I decided to go and watch it, and wow, this was, this really brings me back to the good old days of Spongebob. It really was that good. Um, you know, it, it really is funny, it's action-packed, it throws out so many ideas, and it just ends up being a lot of fun. It's really enjoyable. Now, as a Spongebob fan, I did notice a few... Uh, storylines here and there that were taken from old episodes, but even at that, it was still really fun. The one thing that was weird, I will admit, is that, um, like, you see it advertised everywhere that you'd expect it to be half live action, half animated, and stuff like that, but that's really not the case. It's not mm -hmm. until, like, an hour into the film that they suddenly decide they decided to go into the live action world. Um, most of it is actually hand-drawn, but I'll even admit that the CG animation is actually really well done. Um, like, it, and it still stays true to the, cl to the classic Spongebob animation that we had, so it really was a nice tr uh, transition. But overall, I would say that it is a pleasant surprise over the fact that it brought Spongebob, like, Spongebob that we remember, the Spongebob that pretty much is why he's so popular and one of the most... Uh, well-known cartoon characters in this day and age, so um, yeah, de like absolutely, like I know that there are a lot of people, like, they they don't really care because it is Spongebob but, but for what it is, it brought out something pretty good mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, can't complain because mm. I didn't see the movie. Sadly, I didn't too. I just have one minor question. Um, how much Patrick nudity is there? Patrick nudity? Not that much. Uh, okay. No, there isn't. No, I've seen is, the film yeah, too. There isn't, so. actually. No, there it's, isn't. It's not, it's there not isn't. like in the first movie where like he suddenly flies out. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Did anyone see my bullet? <laughs> No, no, no. Did you see my underwear? No, Patrick. Do you want to? Uh, I just, hey, I just thought the it's movie. It's relatable. It's what every guy feels when he's with a girl. <laughs> Do you want my to? Underwear? <laughs> I can imagine the worst of Adam West. Hey, you want to look a bit of Adam West's penis? <laughs> Uh, and that's an actual Family Guy moment, so I can get away with that. Yeah, yes. I remember. Yes. Yeah, I just thought it was okay. It wasn't. I always think the first one's better than this, this new one. So it's kind of. It's the second half of the first one that bothers me a little. Which one? The first? The second? The Sponge the, out of water. The first one. I I, I I sadly didn't see Sponge Out of Water. I wanted. I want to see Sponge Out of Water, but the first ah. one, it's good. It's nice and goofy, and then. Now we're men, and then Dustin Hoffman, and then yep. the Goofy Gooper David. number at the end. This is my thought. This is, I guess, this is kind of nice and innocent, but at the same time, I still don't get it. <laughs> like a movie from another planet. <laughs> and mind you, this is the first one talking about. I, I still want to see the second yeah. one. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, well, sorry, mate. Yeah, I just okay. needed a bit of involvement in the movie. You can't blame <laughs> me. I just wanted to help. <laughs> no story. What are you doing here? <laughs> That's just John wanted Lennon, to put a piece of thought into it. <laughs> um, so, my pleasant surprise isn't the sponge out of water. Obviously, it's uh, this film you might not uh, have seen because it came out in November. It was Creed. Mm. Creed. Uh, um, the the spin-off of the Rocky films, uh, the seventh one, if you call it. Um, this is actually really interesting, because this is the film that I cried to. I cried at the end of it. It was that touching. It was that touching, like... So, in a nutshell, it's basically about Apollo Creed's son, and how he's going to rise up to be the next big boxer, and Rocky Balboa kind of mentors him and trains him. And Rocky Balboa, oh my god, Sylvester Stallone is, like, amazing in this film. His, his, his performance is, like, heartfelt and touching. Like, you get to know his character, because um, Rocky is uh, he's terminally ill with cancer. Ooh. So, it, so he, he's got that deep, you know, emotional thing. Like, he, he wants to fight it, but then Adonis Creed, the played by Michael B. Jordan, who was also in Fan 4 Stick. <laughs> eh. um, Michael B. Jordan does a better job with this movie than Fan 4 Stick. Uh. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but see, yeah, so that's kind of a twist there, because it's just like, wow, that's, that's like, he's got cancer, what the fuck? Is he gonna live through? He's gonna go through chemo? Is he, it's like, and the bond between Adonis Creed and um, uh, Rocky is just like, really tight like you feel that like connection between them because they you know they train each other you know they it's like i'll help you you help me you know i'll get you through cancer you get me through training and there's this <clears throat> so it, that's the surprising thing about it there's another there's a shot in the film which is glorious like i've never seen this in a film but it's a tracking shot it takes it starts in one room and it keeps moving following adonis creed into the ring for his fight and the fight goes on the fight goes on, no cuts, no edits, it keeps going, the shot keeps going, he turns around, you see the audience, you see Rocky down there, and the shot keeps going, looking at the fight, nothing's going on, it's like one take, and you keep looking around, no cuts, it's like glorious, you know, and then the fight ends, it's like, whoa, whoa, it's breathtaking, I've never seen that before in a movie. I will definitely rent that yeah. one, I've been wanting to do so. My sister said it was good. It's really good. It's, yeah, I definitely, yeah, I definitely really have good. a high interest seeing that one. I mean, considering all the major hype that went into it, it's like, wow. Oh. It's really good. It's really, really good. It's uh, If you follow the Rock movies, this might be a good follow-up to Rocky Balboa. Yeah. And it's funny, he, 
he does wait just one last thing they do mention Rocky's son and he says that his son is in Vancouver living in Vancouver with his wife so that's why he's not there helping Rocky out and stuff. He's like having his own life. He didn't want to become a boxer. So it was just like, yeah, fucking asshole. He can't take care of your father. Help me, son. <laughs> I can't, Dad. I got my wife. She's at like, Hoover. All right, man. Sage didn't want to be in this movie. He's been in front of me. Hey, I'm my dad. Oh, no, wait. You're my dad. I don't no. care. No, no, wait. wait. With this hat on, I look like Mickey. From the rock. Do, do I look like Mickey from the rock? <laughs> oh, yeah. You're gonna eat thunder and you're gonna grab lightning and you're gonna shit hurricanes. <laughs> I've got a yeah, big it's... diarrhea like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> it's, it's also heartfelt because, um. Uh, In days, I, I have... they would do chasing the chicken, now it's chasing the Bulbasaur. <laughs> Get him! Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, I haven't caught up on all the films, so it it's kind of like a sequel to Rocky Four in a sense, because um, you know, because of Apollo Creed's dead, you know, was, and they and it's funny because you see references to the older films where uh, he he has a projector on the wall, he's looking up old fights, so he goes on YouTube and types in like uh, Rocky and Apollo Creed fight, and he's watching it on YouTube on the projector in the in one scene. I was like, okay. Okay, that's pretty cool. They have a nice little homage to Apollo. They don't even like... reference Rocky V, Street Fighter. <laughs> like I said, I haven't watched them all, so I don't know what the reference is. I didn't know whether um, Adrian or Polly died before this film. Because mm. they do the, it's so they died in this. They're they're dead in this film. Then Rocky goes to their tombstones, and they just. He starts reading the paper to Adrian or something. It's like a really touching moment. It's really heartfelt. It has great, you know, fighting act, boxing fights. Like, oh my god, you feel the punches when they punch. Oh my god. Oh my god. I don't want to get punched by a movie. <laughs> it's the power of movies. Bam! Violent cinema. Violent cinema. James, don't you have a pleasant surprise? Yes, I do. It's actually one that um, you guys may not have even heard of. It's called uh, The Intern. Oh, yeah, not... that's true. I've heard of that one oh. with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. Yeah, Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. I hadn't seen a bit of a, a single. I hadn't seen a single bit of advertisement before. Uh, uh, before I went to go see this film. And it was my buddy Matthew. Uh, hi, Matthew, if you're listening to this. Hi. Um, uh, thanks for the movie. It was great. Uh, no, not this Matthew. Matthew. Oh. Another Matthew. Um, but, but uh, yeah, yeah, Robert De Niro plays uh, a guy in his 70s who's... Interestingly enough, the the polar opposite of what what De Niro typically portrays in films. You know, he he's usually been sort of a tough a tough guy, mafiosa, Italiano, what have you. That's that's how he's been typecast over the years. And here, he's an old softy. He's he's he does tai chi on Sunday. <laughs> And he uh, he's been he's been retired for years, and his wife his wife has uh, recently passed away. So he decides to go ahead and and um, uh, busy his life a bit by joining an internship program, and it sets him up with this uh, this design company uh, where he's where he's uh, working for Anne Hathaway's character. It was at first a little bit confused because she's like, "Okay, I'm getting an intern. It's going to be a young, young somebody, maybe somebody in their twenties, studying, studying uh, beauty and design in college and whatnot." And she's, she gets this seventy-something-year-old uh, guy and doesn't know what to do with him. And so it's it's offsetting it. It's very off-putting at first, but the the irony is that. 
because De Niro's character is a guy who's already seen life and already been there in so many places and done that, he's he's meeting up, he's befriending all the all the young people that work for this company, and um, he's uh, uh, he's he he becomes a vital part of the group just by. Uh, just by offering advice and helping other people out, saying, "Okay, I can draw. I can draw from experience here." Um, and this is what happens. Some some legitimately funny uh, scenarios come out of this. Um, there there's one <laughs> there's one brilliant scene where um, I don't want to give too too much away, but Anne Hathaway while while uh, sending emails. To different people on on her phone, accidentally sends a nasty email about her mother to her mother. And uh, when they when they get to the the when they get to work when they get to the beauty design place, she tells everybody what happened. And De Niro actually leads a bunch of these uh, these young guys on a mission to break into Anne Hathaway's mother's house. And uh, Damage her computer before she actually gets the email. Um, it, it's it, it's a it's a moment where they sort of think about you know bending the laws, the laws that we have, but um, it's it's for a good purpose. I think we should say, but um, yeah, I would I would recommend this for like sort of the feel good movie of the year. That's why I picked it for the pleasant surprise. Hmm. Okay. And my pick for pleasant surprise is the Peanuts movie, and this is one I was hyped for ever since the teaser trailer. And I walked in, I crossed my fingers, I said, "Okay, Blue Sky, you've done Ice Age, you've done Rio, you've done know, Ice Age, you've done Rio, um, you've done Ice Age." <laughs> I, I know you guys can do something good, and I wish they did more movies like this. I was in tears at the end. This was really well done. Peanuts Me too. Peanuts is a huge part of my childhood. The idea that mm -hmm. Charlie Brown has been at it for 65 years. Trying to fly a kite, trying to get noticed, trying to be, you know, great with his friends, trying to get noticed by a little redhead girl, and just all these things in general. And finally, this is his big shot to show exactly what kind of person he is. I thought that was actually really clever and smart. The fact that Schultz's kids wrote this movie made it even more intriguing. The fact that this is... Son and... Thank you. Um, son. The fact that this is his understanding of what... of how important his father's work was to him and everyone else, and representation of that is so crucial to know about, because this is pretty much peanuts in a nutshell. Charlie Brown is there, again. Um, you have Linus, who's... Linus, Lucy, who's of course trying to be the head of it all, Snoopy and his crazy daydreams, and his pal Woodstock. It, to, to me, it just brought me back to that time when I was, you know, so innocent and a kid and doing all these different things, trying to find an identity and being who I am. And there's the one thing that I found interesting. Um, unlike Tomorrowland, I felt the message of optimism was done a whole lot better here. Because here you have Charlie Brown trying different things, trying to get noticed, trying to be popular. And yet they fail. My favorite, of course, being the book report because he works so hard on it. He actually reads yes. more in peace. He's like, "Yes, I saved you. This is it." And then it flows in the air, and then the little red baron plane that they set off early in the film yes. passes by and shreds yes. it. It was so unpredictable. And I loved it. I thought they were going to do the cliched mm -hmm. route and have a rainstorm. I'm glad they didn't go that route. <laughs> Um, I was okay with the ending. I thought it was perfect for what it was. Because again, keep into account. 65 years! Charlie mm -hmm. Brown needs a break, and this is it. Um, I like the animation as a nice stop-motion quality kind of feel to it, even though it's CG. I like the fact they got the archival voice of... Um, Bill Melendez. Bill Melendez, thank you, doing the voice of Snoopy and Woodstock. I thought that was a very nice touch. <laughs> Everything else was fine. I'm trying to think of nitpicks, but the only ones I can think of is really the daydream scenes. Those go on for like a tad touch too long. And for someone like Kristen Chesnowick to voice Snoopy's love interest in those daydream scenes, and all she does is, it's like you could have gotten any 
celebrity like Amy Poehler would have been fine. Um, yeah, it's like um, it, it, it's kind of like oh, Alvin yeah. and the Chipmunks, where like the names are useless. Yeah, yeah, you just replace them anyone, and they'll be just the same kind of Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, so for me, I thought it was heartwarming. I thought it was well done. Thank God it's rated G. We need a break from all that PG rating kind of stuff. Why did Inside Out need to be rated PG? God, who knows? But I know that. Good dinosaur deserved a PG for being too thrilling for me. Um, yeah, we. Uh, I, I wanted to say this when I got out of the when I got out of the out of the film. Here was my experience. We sat down. Uh, it was me and my buddy uh, LT. We sat down in the theater. We watched the movie, and I'm sitting through all the advertisements at the beginning, saying, "God, these movies all look the same. They they've all got the same formula. They've all got the." The hips, the hip characters, and I don't, I don't know if these are very interesting. You know, they're all family films that are you're supposed to be appealed to. Uh, as it, uh, if you like peanuts, you like this. And I'm looking at, looking at all these, and I'm saying, okay, burp and fart jokes, ha ha. That's all. That's all cool. And I'm sitting down, and I watch this movie after all that. And you know, I'm like, wow. It's so clean. And, and, and the other important thing, too, one, it's timeless. You don't see televisions or computers, minus a typewriter. That keeps it really nice and perfect. No, plus the fact, don't forget to, that they actually have a like a rotary phone. Like, they actually, like, yes. they hold the phone and it had a cord in it. Yes! That, that was really nice. It brought me back a lot of memories. And the final thing, too, all kid actors. Unknown mm -hmm. kid actors. That was a really but nice touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was surprisingly done. So, I'd say this one really, really high marks. This really was a great surprise for me. Yeah, it, it's absolutely hands down DreamWorks' best effort for years. DreamWorks. Except, no, I mean DreamWorks. Sorry, Blue, uh, Blue Sky's best effort that they've done in freaking years. Um, at least you didn't say but, Sony Pictures but, Entertainment. At no. least you didn't. At least oh, you didn't no. say Anastasia was done by Disney. Oh yeah. No, no, no. But the thing is, is that I love the fact that they didn't even go to the hip route. That like they didn't go mm -mm. into the same category of like uh, what Alvin and the Chipmunks Road Chip or what Hotel Transylvania Two does, where they try so hard to be really hip with the cool kids instead of like trying to focus on making an actual good story or having actual likable characters. This one does. They focus on the heart of what makes the peanuts work, and like they they're full on serious with it, and like they're fully committed to that. And it really shows. It worked out so well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. plus the fact, I gotta say, like, quickly, the animation is just freaking phenomenal. The fact, like, it, this is the first, like, this is the first time I've probably ever seen, like, thir like computer animation that looks exactly like 2D animation. Uh -huh. I want to see more animated features like that, where they completely hide the notion that this is, like, it has a 3D environment, and just put in, like, this flat 2D characters. Like, I want to see it done more like that. And, like, where, where I've seen many failed, this one actually succeeded. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, definitely a good one to check out. Uh, up next is our most forgettable category. Uh, yeah. Matt, what you got? Yeah, For me... <laughs> I, I don't know, I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, <laughs> no, the thing is, I was thinking either maybe Cinderella or maybe Home, but then I recently saw one that, like, really took the cake, and for me, that was Goosebumps. Like, I will admit that there are a lot of good moments with Goosebumps, um, like, especially how it tries to, like, what it does with uh, all the Goosebumps scenes, like, whatever has to do with Goosebumps books, and, like, whatever Jack Black does, it's definitely fun. He knows exactly how to be over-the-top and enjoyable, but then you also got the moments that are really bad, like, the story itself and the characters are so badly written and often they can be so stupid and so cliched. It's just, it feels unbearable and it feels like a waste of time. For me, mm. the reason why it's most forgettable is that when you take the good and you take the bad, it's just you get something that's eh. And for me, I only want to remember just the good scenes and Jack Black from it. I don't want to remember this movie as a whole. And that's why for me, it's kind of forgettable because like, like, what do you think of Goosebumps the movie? It's just, like, when you refer to the movie itself, like, uh, but when you tell me about, like, what parts of Goosebumps that are good, like, then I can explain to you. 
well, Foxy's not happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, boy. I, I was tempted to put this in my guilty pleasures, but another movie came into play there. Um, for me, mm -hmm. this movie plays it a little too safe. It is sort of Jumanji, but with books, and I think what they do is kind of interesting. Um, I think mm. the main problem is that first third of the movie, where you're getting introduced to the characters, and they're sort of cliched and stock. When the mayhem happens, that's only when the movie gets interesting. That's mm -hmm. the only mm -hmm. time it gets that's interesting. Yeah, you got the abominable snow monster, Pasadena, you got Slappy, you got the lawn gnomes, the bear traps in the basement, werewolf fever swamp who looks like CGI shit. Um, oh, yeah. The, one of my favorite gags where they go against this praying mantis, you're like, praying mantis? I don't remember writing that. Oh, wait, now I do. <laughs> um, what carries that movie is the manic personality of Jack Black. Just how he's so manic and crazy in this... The uh, role of R.L. Stein is more demented than possible, and just this whole universe that he's created. And I think that's more of the interesting elements of the movie that I am going to take away from. Uh, yeah, I'm going to agree. The main characters are not really that interesting, aside from the girl, which is a really nice twist, because we find oh, out yeah. later she's a character mm -hmm. from one of the books, which I thought was nice. And not to mention Mike's favorite character, Champ, with the big buck teeth. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. I, yes. I, I would I would go as far as saying it's a bad film. I'd say it's watchable, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's forgettable because there are points where I do look back on and say, "All right, that's that's it's a decent family film. I can show that to my kids once in a while." But there's better. I only want to mm -hmm. show like if I want to show that to my kids, I only show them the good parts. I don't want to waste their time with freaking garbage with the first half. Well, let me put it this way: if this movie came out 20 years ago in like the early in like the mid 90s or so when the books were popular. Maybe it could have done better. That oh, it would have no. It would have done so much better. Oh yeah, I mean they had stuff like they had like a small. I know, I read up somewhere they did like a small attraction in Disney World where it was like very horrible. Yes, themed. I remember. I was there. And you're not gonna believe this. You know what the reason why they ended that one? What? They had a little gift shop. All these T-shirts, mugs, and all this other merchandise and stuff didn't sell well. If merchandise That's from a. Just like Merchandise didn't sell well? Just because the merchandise didn't sell well. If your merchandise doesn't sell well, you're out of the park. I was disappointed. Wow. I was disappointed. Wow. Even our little mm -hmm. was bummed. Yeesh. Wow. Uh, next up in the disappointment. Yeah, right. Next up in the forgettables, we have... So, yes. Yes, so... I was thinking about what was the most forgettable of this year... Uh, to 2015, and I went through. I was trying to think of all the movies I was like watching, and I totally forgot I went to see this. I went to see Taken Three. I forgot about that. <laughs> see, you forgot oh my about God, it. I should have had it on. <laughs> For some reason, yes! I thought it was. I thought that was released last year or something. It, they, it, the Wikipedia page is confusing because it says 2014, but I think it's like a international, like a. I don't know. I don't know where it was premiered first, but it came in the U.S. Uh, last year of this month, on the 9th of 2015. So actually, a year ago exactly. I was like, what? what? So I was like, that is. I, I totally forgot about it. Like, Taken Three is like okay. So they a cash in for the the Taken franchise. Oh, whoopie do. The first one was really good. The second one was like a retread of the first one, which, eh. And this one. I don't know what it is. I forgot all it's about it. It's like, I, I guess it's like I all I remember is that, uh, spoiler alert. Uh, Liam Neeson's, uh, I think his name is Brian Mills. His wife dies, and it's a big thing. Like, oh my gosh, she died. And then Forrest Whitaker is in this movie all of a sudden. And then there's a he gets. God, it's like. The action, I couldn't remember. Remember, I think it's just basically he gets framed for being, for killing his wife, and he has he's on the yes. run. It's that's the basic plot, but I don't remember anything else from it. It's so forgettable, and it's at like ten percent on Rotten Tomato, even lower than the second one. It's like the lowest. It's like, okay, there's no more sequels of that anymore. Call it quit. Mm-hmm. Am I? Uh... My pick for a, a Melissa McCarthy film, uh, my, my, I mean, forgettable film. Uh, <laughs> my pick for the Melissa McCarthy <laughs> film is the forgettable. 
I was just thinking that because you know, uh, uh, what what I'm trying to say is they're almost synonymous, yeah. but um, with uh, yeah, and her character in Bridesmaids that stood out. That was the only yeah. that was the only good part. Anyways, I, I moving on. Um, yeah, I was going to uh, I, I was going to go with the Melissa McCarthy pick. Then I remembered. That Melissa McCarthy film was another year, so I get, they're so forgettable. I get them mixed up. So I'm gonna go with the uh, <laughs> uh, oh, I Morgan. Know you, I know who, what you're saying. You go sleepy weepy now. You go sleepy weep. You go sleepy weepy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Uh, chappy. What? Most most forgettable? Shabby? Spy. Yeah, me too. How is that Melissa yeah. McCarthy? How is Melissa McCarthy in Spy? I didn't say she was. I didn't say she Why'd was. Why'd you say... I, I said you I say was, McCarthy? I said I was going to go for a Melissa McCarthy film at first, but I thought that film was from it. But I thought that was film for his, from this year... And it turns out it was another year. It turns out it was 2013, the one that oh. I was going for. And here I am, and I was ready with a Ghostbusters joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was going to talk about the most disgusting scene in Spy, where Melissa McCarthy kills a henchman, the henchman falls off the balcony, lands on a spike, then a knife comes down, hits him in the head, ooh, tons of blood. What does Melissa McCarthy do? Keep in mind, this is all in slow-mo. Melissa McCarthy... Up Chuck's orange stew goes onto the corpse. I'm sitting there going. People said this was funny. This got 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. What the fuck? Wait, do you think Rotten Tomatoes is accurate? Well, let me put yeah. this way. Let me put this way. When your spy comedy has many bullets to the head and he's got this little mystery. Can I get blood. to my movie? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Wrap up your thought, Morgan. Uh, no, Sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, go on. Chappy. Ch Why is it forgettable? Chappy. It, it's forgettable what? because Morgan and I sat down and watched it, and it it took it as I was digging through the different films of this year. I uh, I came across that one, and I forgot that it was released this year. Oh. Okay. And it took me a while to think about it because I forgot why I hated it. And then, and then, as the memories started flowing back to me, then I remembered because because it uh, it it paints this it paints this picture of of the world this uh, this South Africa that um, that Neil Blomkamp likes to pimp out so much as mm -hmm. such an unforgivably rotten rotten world. And we, you know, we've got this. We got this character who's kind of like, uh, who, uh, who's kind of like uh, number five from Short Circuit, uh, being a being a, a sentient robot who's uh, who's fresh and uh, and innocent like a child. And uh, the watching him get, he's just getting beaten. He's just getting the snot beaten out of him. For for no apparent reason other than he's he's a police bot and they don't like police bots and then he's taken advantage of by a gang uh, because they they like his strength and they like his ignorance they can they can take advantage of that and make and make money and it is I it it is a a rotten world that is portrayed on film and I'm glad that that critics hated this because. It, I think they're starting to wake up. I don't. I've never liked Neil Blomkamp from from his other work, District Nine. Uh, Elysium was laughably bad, even though even though I know people who thought it was brilliant. Chappie, everyone everyone said no. This is getting tired. I said, and I'm sitting here thinking, it was tired from the get go. Ha! Oh. 
withhold my thoughts for obvious reasons. But for me, mm. most forgettable, I really had to think hard because it was between a comedy or another kind of movie. So I was going to originally go with Unfinished Business, but I only saw half of it. And if you don't see the whole movie, it doesn't count. The only things I remember from that film is a really uncomfortable scene where Vince Vaughn has to go into a nude sauna. And there's a 60-year-old woman. Mind you, they show it cooch and all. And this really weird running gag where he has to stay in a hotel, but the hat trick is that it's actually a museum. So they have this small apartment-like display that he lives in, and everybody thinks it's like an art exhibit or something like that, and he's like living in the art exhibit. It's like table and all. It's, it's really weird. So, 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 that, so that would have been my pick. So my pick instead is the Nicholas Spark adaptation, The Longest Ride. Are you... <laughs> Wait, which one? The Longest Ride? I... It has, I, uh... It has... I... Wait. It has Clint Eastwood's son, Scott Eastwood, playing the male lead. It's about cowboys and rodeo. I've I've heard about it. Uh, this remember. looks stupid. Here's what I remember. Guy is a rodeo performer on a bull, breaks his back. Oh no, there's this big bull that if you ride on, he'll break your back. And then they somehow interwove it with this story with this elderly couple that tried to be together and go through all the odds and she was an artist. And then there's this really weird segue story where they try to adopt this kid from this low-life family. Yeah, that's all I remember. And then, like, she dies or something, and her art is, like, discovered or something, and it's masterpiece, and they try to auction it off. And, spoiler alert, the guy dies after he tells the whole story, just like in the notebook. And instead, it's, like, young love passing a torch. I... You're murdered. That, that's all I remember. It, it, oh, it's God. not interesting. It's, it's typical romantic fluff. And as mm -hmm. much as I hate to say this, I was going to go with Fifty Shades of Grey, but there was stuff I remembered in there more, because I knew the point and purpose. Longest Ride mm -hmm. has no point, no purpose, no motivation to the point. You don't remember what you watched afterwards. That's how bad it is. I'd rather stick with the notebook. Thank you very much. Mm. Alright. <clears throat> the next category up is uh, the What the Fuck film. Which is a eight, film where eight. we... Oh, gee, Mike. Thanks to our younger viewers out there. Is it too late to change it to What the Fridge film? Because <laughs> Matt can't say what the fuck. What's with the hands thing? This is me being the innocent questionnaire. <laughs> I just do it for humor. Oh, okay, Mr. To, Puppy. Oh, I have heard. dyslexia. Can't you tell? Okay, Mr. Puppy. <laughs> All right, we've heard of, we heard Matt swear before in the past. Anyways, first, okay. Anyways, for my W two F keep Luke Wilson away from me. But anyway, that's the W two F film, a film that maybe you said, "What the fuck?" It's, okay, I don't have one in general that like for the entire movie, but I do have one like there are several scenes that just let me like, dazed and confused. And for me, that one is The Good Dinosaur. And I'll explain. Mm. Like, I generally like the movie. Like, I thought it was good. Like, it's really not as good as the other Pixar films, but, like, overall, like, it's not bad. Um, but the thing is, is that there were several scenes I thought it was just, like, so weird. The first one that shocked me was, spoiler alert, the dad dies at the beginning. Like, we just see, like, he, was, he wasn't going to make it with, um, Okay, it is kind of predictable that he would die, but just the way they did it was really freaking brutal. It's Boom. like you just see... black grave. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just like you just see a top, like you just smiles on Arlo, and then you just just suddenly it's just there. <laughs> and suddenly it just appears, and then you see a grave. So it's like, what just happened? Holy crap! Well, that went by fast. And then, weird scene number two, and at least this is the best scene, is when you see the 
Yeah, the wood. <laughs> the pet that... order! Yes, the Straggy's Horse pet order! <laughs> and it's actually played by the director, Peter Son. It's like he's such a weird character. Like, he's hol- it's like he's hilariously weird, but for some reason, after, like, his bird goes out, we never see him again. No, Debbie, you're better than this. Yeah, yeah, like, I don't, yeah, like, they, it's like he's just out of nowhere. Like, the only reason he's there is to forcefully give Arlo, um, like, the cave kid a name, which is Spot. <laughs> so, like, and, like, even his names that he goes there, it's like, he, he's just there, like, beast. Killer, murderer, maniac, violent. <laughs> it's just, it's like the best character in there. I don't know why they don't see him again. But I gotta say, the re- and then like, there is another one. Morgan will get more into it. it like I'll let, I'll let you have it. Is the scene where like, uh, like uh, wait up, so I pushed out. It's the scene where <laughs> they eat this little creature. Morgan will tell you about that. And finally, but the weirdest one of them all, the one that really freaked me out the most, and I don't, I don't know why the internet is not going into it as much, is the scene when they eat the rotten fruit. That one freaked me out. It's like, suddenly, it's like, they, they start laughing, and then suddenly, like, they start to see <laughs> the genetics, and it's like, what's going on? What's going on? Why, is, why does Arlo have more eyes? Why is his head growing big? I'm scared. Help me. What's going on? Yeah, it's a when did this movie turn into... Huh? It's a mini version of The Hangover in five seconds. Oh, when, yeah. did this... when... when did this movie turn into Adventure Time? And then and I looked over to you and I said, when did this turn into Gumball? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that's... exactly. Yeah, that's pretty much... It's not my biggest WTF movie, but it's definitely the one that I had the most WTFs. My problem with this movie is this. Um, you have these nice, beautiful backgrounds, amazing water. But the problem is when you have water that looks so good and you have these really cartoony designs plashed together to it, it's not going to mix very well. Somehow they turn into a western with dinosaurs. And here's my problem. You can do cliches. Fine. Reheat plots. Okay. Fine. But at least make the journey interesting. He, we have this small character here and his pet dog, who's a human. Okay, fine. Um, and he's going into these different characters in the Alice in Wonderland kind of scenario. And these characters don't meet up. This whole universe is, like, very separate from each other. He, he meets the Strachiosaurus. He meets the, the T-Rexes who act like cattle um, cowboys. All these bison herd and stuff like that. And one of them is voiced by Sam Elliott, which is the only good part of the movie. I felt like that should have been the main thing. He runs into the T-Rexes, he becomes a part of them, it turns into the searchers, meets True Grit, they get him home, that should have been the whole movie in a nutshell. Um, but instead, it just comes off as a random series of sorts strung together, and it just kind of meanders. And I already mentioned my problem with the ending there. When he meets those uh, new family, they could be anyone. They could have been aunts and uncles, they could have been grandparents when the kid meets them, <laughs> they could have been the actual parents, only they dyed their hair. <laughs> hell, hell, yeah. hell! The, the dark ending, I told James, would have been this. The minute Arlo leaves them, the, the parents would have looked at the little kid and be like, Okay, here's tonight's dinner! Yes. <laughs> they just decided to eat the kid for no reason. And speaking of which, that scene with the pterodactyls, oh my god! That was out of nowhere. They find this little cute creature that they go through the trouble to save, and he's like, "Oh, we, you, 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 you little free little creature is going," and then just out of nowhere, the the pterodactyl takes him, right in the mouth, this little tail sticking out. I'm doing okay. Maybe it's that cliche thing where they he's still alive or something. No, the other two have like a tug of war in the tail. It's still out of his mouth. I'm sitting there back going. I think Pixar might need some Prozac after this. There's points where it goes unnecessarily dark, unnecessarily hard. This could have been a nice, simple tale. Hell, it looks like Gumby mixed with Lawrence of Arabia. But it just comes off as a train wreck. A little kid uh, bites a giant bug's head off. I was okay with that. Um, <laughs> um, but here's the thing, when I was watching that movie and they got to that scene where the dad's death happened, this is what happened. Kids started talking. They weren't crying. They weren't silent. They were talking. I heard a little voice go, Mommy, 
Did the dad actually die? It's pretty sad when you have kids questioning your movie and talking when it's playing instead of afterwards. <sighs> wow. Okay. I... I... I enjoyed it. Dad, I can... <laughs> You were there. <laughs> gave you this feel. I miss. I, I, I miss you. I miss you. I know. Yeah. All right. Uh, Your choice, Mike. So, Morgan and James, do you have the film that I think I have on my list? <laughs> Here we are now. I, I took a entertain us. <laughs> I yes. You guys, I took a 360 and chose a different movie, so go ahead, Knuckleheads. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll surprise thank you. you. I'll surprise you. you. You'll surprise me, alright. I had to choose Pan. Hmm. Oh my god, Pan. <laughs> Pan. Pan. I was gonna put this in the worst category, but I was like thinking, no, this had the most WTFs for me. Like, the most obvious WTF for me was they first coming to Neverland. Pan's like, Is this. <laughs> and they start sing and they start singing smells like teen spirit. I'm like So the answer is What yes. the heck am I watching? <laughs> what am I watching? Okay, Mike, can I I remember this clearly. Can I resume to you like what happened exactly? Because the man you guys told me that was the weirdest thing. You didn't tell me that was just a fraction of the weirdest things. Because okay, here's the thing. The scene starts out the kids are in bed, then suddenly bungee jumping pirates, Boing. like in like kidnapping kids, then suddenly you see the roll doll uh, nun pretty much kick Pan into one of the bungee jumping pirates, and then suddenly there's like they're in this they're in the ship, and they're pr now it's turning into a flying battle scene where it's like the ship is fighting against World War II pilots, and then suddenly they go up into space. And then they go back down into a Super Mario Galaxy level. And then suddenly they go down again into Neverland. And that's when they enter, like, you see Pan, Pan Qu Peter questioning, is this Canada? Everybody singing tea, uh, smells like teen spirit. And then you just see Hugh Jackman being as over the top as possible. <laughs> you know what? Surprisingly enough, one of the things I was actually all right with was the was the pirate ship fighting World War II pilots. That was the most normal yeah, that thing that this neat. movie had to offer. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, yeah, so I thought that was like, that, that, that should be like in the Chuck Mario of a Peter Pan movie. Must have flying pirate ship fight over two pilot planes. It's like the, the common thing. I'm trying to... Sorry, huh? go on. Sorry, go on. I'm trying to explain this movie to my folks over the dinner table. And, and it's just like, okay, well, Captain <laughs> Hook is in this movie. But he's a uh, he's a John Wayne cowboy. He's a cowboy. Yes, <laughs> he he's a cowboy. Who doesn't actually doesn't... have? Who doesn't no, actually have a hook for a hand? They call it. They they just sort of have him polishing a hook in the in one scene, and that's about it. Yes. Yes, and he bangs against the prison wall, yeah, because... digging a hole for Pan to get out, and that's because it. Because and... as a fairy godmother was not enough. Careful, Captain Hook. There's crocodiles here. Crocodiles. <laughs> And uh, really get down to why he's afraid of of the crocodile? Or nope. Yeah. Okay, that's nope. what I thought. I yeah. think the best way to sum up this movie, and I'm gonna half quote Brad Jones doing my variation. There was so yeah. much cocaine in the writers' room that it couldn't fit Hugh Jackman's trailer, so they spread it all out to the actors and the filmmakers. <laughs> And the quote Brad Jones, Hook wiped its ass with this movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. It's just I want it was like all I wanted to I wanted to, to marathon Hook after after watching this film just to wash the taste out. Um it they they have this yeah, the pirates are, are kidnapping kids from different points in time. Uh, to 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 mine for pixie pixium, dust, or, pixium, pixium, or as they call it, yes. pixum, and it it sort of with with the uh, the mining structures and everything. I'm getting this I'm getting this very anti-industrial era vibe g coming from all of this with you know the pirates versus the Indians, you know Western. 
culture and whatnot. I, 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 I'd rather go back to that because at least that was <laughs> that was entertaining. Entertaining here we, racist. It, it, well, here we have the uh, the white British Indians in this movie with very colorful yes. clothing. Oh, the cast is the cast is so whitewashed; it's unbelievable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, you have R- Rooney, Ma- Rooney Mara, yeah, yeah Rooney Mara, pa- playing uh, Tiger Lily, who's a Native American. What the fuck? What the fuck? Why they couldn't get a Native American actress to play her? It's like, no. And then like the they the, were all the, taken for, the chief uh, the ridiculous six. You forgot one more thing. Hindu Smee. Oh what? <laughs> Hindu Smee? Smee's played by he Hindu. Like, he's like an Indian, like a like Hindu Indian. Oh, I, I never... He's like he's a very dark face. Mm-hmm. It was weird. It's it, this film is just the story is all over the place. Like Pixium is like at one point Captain. Uh, Noob, 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 noob. Blackbeard. 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 I, I caught myself before I no, said no, it. No, 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 no. Blackbeard. It's Hugh Jackman. It's Hugh Jackman. It's Hugh Jackman as Doctor Frankenfurter. That, that's okay, the only way to song the performance. Okay. Yeah. So he he hit, he has pixie and he puts it on his face because he's like he ages and old and so he makes him young again. I'm like, well, where's that popped out of? It came out of nowhere. It's like he didn't mention about making him young or nothing like that. It's just like. Remind me of uh, Snow White and the Huntsman when the Queen did that for Souls or something. I was like, "What the fuck is going on with this movie? What? What? Who? Wait. And and mind you, the writer, the writer of this film, is um, Sean Fox. No, Jason, Jason Fox. Fox. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the correction. I don't no have the resource. Jason. Jason, not, Jason you might Fox. Know his brother Fred Moore. <laughs> not Fred Moore. I mean, like you might know his brother Fred. Mm-hmm. It's, it, that explains why the movie is so fucked up. Yes, oh. um, you I, have Indians I, that are made out of chalk, colored chalk. Hey, you wrote a movie about pirates? <laughs> yeah, but it's Ice Age Continental Drift. Hey, can you write a movie about Peter Pan? I'll try. The, yes, the exactly. The reason I didn't choose this movie for my picking is because I just didn't care at all about it. Uh, there's even a scene where Blackbeard is forcing kids off a plank, and he jumps on a plank, and a kid falls off. I Turn to James. James is like, a kid just died, yes. and I didn't care about that. I didn't care about the whole film. That's why I wasn't into the madness. That's why I wasn't into the bonkers, um, because there's a lot of crazy elements. There are some creative yet crazy things, and to be fair, the yes. effects are better than the 2003 Peter Pan, but oh, yeah. you know those are not on a digital set. But I just didn't really right. care much at all about this film. It just felt like an A to B hero's journey story with way too many problems and really bizarre stuff. The WTF film choice for me, surprisingly, actually goes to Max, and I'll explain why. Um, it's supposed to be about service dogs in the war, in the army. Oh, that, that, oh, that Max. Oh, oh. That Max, yes. Don't get it confused with Mad oh. Max. Don't get it. No, there, there's two Max let, films. I think there's let th- me explain because this is either number four or number two on my worst of films here. That oh, is wow. how bad this movie is. It, 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 I was going to watch Max, but I skipped it. Don't make me get the sure, sure. Um, Sorry. So it first starts off like bait. The dog is traumatized. He gets like picked up by a family, the kids, like a bond or something like that. And the parents are all like, "Oh, we don't think the dog's good or anything like that." That is the okay yet forgettable. The kid has a bonding, so forth and so forth. Now, here is the bad shit craziness of the movie. And don't get me wrong, I love my country. I love America. I'm partly Scottish. I like things American. Rose McGowan, Raquel Welch, Statue of Liberty. Mm-hmm. This film was so fondue in its patriotic glory, I felt uncomfortable and unclean while watching it. And I this knew was, it. And this was the same guy that directed. Uh, did, did he direct Run with the Titans? Did, did he? I think he did. I'll take a look. All right, I know it's uh, the director's name is Bozayakin. 
Uh, yeah, Remember that the Titans. That doesn't sound American. Yeah, yeah, he, he directed Remember the Titans. So, here's my problem with the movie. I'm okay with the dog trying to recover from his loss, because in the story, and I'll try to keep it short, um, is Master is with him over in Iraq, and they do a mind search, and the guy gets killed in the crossfire. And so the dog is now with the family, and the younger kid he's with is actually the brother of that person. That's the part I can tell you about the movie. Here's the batch insane version. His deceased older brother, who got killed in Iraq, has a best friend who is smuggling weapons that they were taking from Iraq posts and actually smuggling them and selling them to thugs and mobsters. So it becomes part Turner and Hooch, part twins, and whatever movie, I don't know. It is so weird. And the fact that when you see the trailers and the TV commercials, they pass it off as like a because of Win Dixie kind of movie, only with a service dog. I would have been fine with that. But this whole second act becomes Beethoven, but with guns. Beethoven had guns. I said Beethoven with guns. Instead of the dog experimenting with the evil laboratory Professor Fonsworth scientists, it's all about weapon smuggling. And okay. I was and I was really uncomfortable with that. Uh, it's set on Fourth of July. There's stuff with the army. It is so smug about its patriotism. I clenched. I didn't cringe. I clenched. And they have that whole last battle where the, these foreign, like Spanish type mafia guy and the evil friend is trying to sell the bazookas and the rocket launchers to them. And I'm just sitting there going, "This is a family movie." They, 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 this is a family movie, and even they go, even they have like this whole ending where there's like this small dedication to all the service dogs of the war. When that was over, I was offended. I was like, really? That's what your whole movie's about? Service dogs? What about that bizarre weapon smuggling subplot that had to do with anything? You could to all the weapon smugglers in the world. Exactly. I was so uncomfortable after that that I couldn't believe what I just watched. It, it was that what the fuck for me. Like, like, Pan, I'm fine because that's standard fantasy bonkersness trying to be a family movie, but it fails on every level. Max? I don't get you. Yeah. I, I, I don't get you. Service dogs in the army plus weapon smuggling. There, there were only two scenes... I was actually, that actually almost legitimately felt more well written. There's one where the kid comforts the dog because it's during the 4th of July and there's fireworks going off and the dog thinks it's like gunshots and stuff and he gets in the cage dog house with them and he tries to comfort them. That I thought was fine. And later there's a scene with the father played by Tom Hayden Church. I know better as Lyle from George of the Jungle. Has a heart to heart mm -hmm. scene with the son where he, you know, mentions this wartime story and stuff where he actually you know, flopped up in the war or something like that. If the whole movie was like those two scenes, it would have been a decent family picture. Uh, picture. Everything else around it, it's my north. It's that unclean. Yeah, I knew this movie right. had a foul stench of America on it. <sighs> it I, I had every way right to avoid it. There, there's only one way to sum this up, and that's the America IHOP commercial. It, it, it's it, it's so smug in itself. <laughs> It's like America. No, it's not America. It's generic America. It thinks it's America, but it's not. Wow. And I and I, I hate it. Surprised. I hate it. I. But yeah, it's on your worst. <clears throat> I, uh, I I think I'd rather listen to the uh, the song that plays at Disney World when you go see the the talking presidents. Yeah. Oh, Hall of Presidents. Yeah. America. <laughs> Stand on free oh, wings. Yeah. What I, I, a an adventure. Oh my god. I, I can picture Sam the Eagle just in the audience of this movie going, Is nothing sacred? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. You, I remember this is, this, is, this is Michael Bay trying to do a family movie. That's how bad this is. 
I remember when I came out of, of the American Adventure, me and my dad, all we did, like, we came out, we, we did nothing but sing the Eagle Impressions. Sorry that I went off topic, but that, that just brought me back a, right. a, 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 a good memory of, like, when we, we noticed stupid patriotism and we're just there like, lol. <laughs> Alright. The next category is uh, Hidden yes. Gems. We got four more people. Let's try and zip through. <laughs> I know. Halfway. I know. Uh, Hidden Gems are basically films that people do not know of. They're Hidden Gems. Yeah. Okay, so for me, technically, it might get some recognition right now thanks to the award season, but even afterwards, it will still count as a hidden gem. For me, I decided to go with Ex Machina. This is a movie that seriously makes you think. And, um, like, because the whole concept is about artificial intelligence and about this one guy who was selected by, um,. Uh, this, like, pretty much a parody of, like, Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs and stuff like that, where he secretly created this, um, artificial, this, um, this robot that has actual artificial intelligence. And then you see an actual relationship that's been going on and how the robot, tr like, uh, the, the robot communicates with the, like, how they start forming, uh, a bond or even a relationship at that point where like you, you start to feel like you, you start to have feelings for both of them and stuff like that. And this is a movie that seriously makes you think it makes you wonder, uh, what's the point? Like it makes you point, like makes you think it's like, what would you do when you do, when you confront, uh, an artificial robot, like a robot with artificial intelligence, do you like, would you treat it like it actually is a human being or do you remember that like it's a robot and stuff like that? So it's not actually human. So it really does go, like, dive deep into it, and it does make you think about it. And, like, it really does, um, like, it, it, it re like, it does make you think, and it does answer these questions. And the more you discover about, uh, like, the more you discover about, like, uh, the dude, like, the inventor's uh, creations and often, like, what he has previously done with the project and stuff like that, it is rather intriguing, I must say. And, like, the, the more deep that you get into it the more intelligent that it gets and like it uh, i'm not going to spoil anything but there are a lot of twists and turns that are unexpected and they really are intelligent and they do end up making you think more and this is from the guy that wrote 28 days later i believe and that's how i ended up wa watching it because um, i actually funny enough i actually ended up watching it uh during a bachelor party and uh but the one major credit i gotta give is the guy who played the inventor in there like, the guy who made the robot, like, that guy gave such a phenomenal performance. Like, honestly, I'm kind of shocked and a little bit offended that he didn't get, rec uh, didn't get recognized in, like, the best supporting role. Uh, it, it, it's just really, really that good. Like, he has such charisma and he has such charm. Like, it, it really, well, not charm, but, like, he, it, his performance is definitely, it feels very complex it's fresh it's funny it's definitely amazing so um de uh, absolutely ex machina is a hidden gem are you talking about oscar isaac which one yeah that oscar isaac don't 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 i see his name here in there yeah because he's also in the He's also in The Force Awakens. Okay, yeah, I know, I know. It's been a while. Well, it's been a okay. while since I checked anything about about Ex Machina. So, sorry, I just want, I just want, I was just asking. I was like, wait, supporting. Sorry, it sounded familiar. Okay, no, but no, um, Oscar Isaac did such a phenomenal job there. Oh yeah, it's a phenomenal up and coming actor. Um, so, I told you guys. Uh, before the podcast, that you can have an optional of two movies as a tie for a category. And I didn't want to cheat and say, oh, I have the only one that does that. So for me, Hidden Gems has a tiebreaker between two films. I couldn't choose one or the other. Mike, so. is the road chip on there? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not Hidden Gem because everybody's probably seen it more or less no. or avoided it. People have seen hit, hit Road Chip? No. Everybody decides to go see I, Force Away. It's a. Oh come on! It's <laughs> give give. All right, short little thing. Kevin saw it the, the road day, kind of liked it. 
Yes, Devin agreed with me. She liked it. I liked it. Yep, that's it's for better than the reasons. previous. I mean, different reasons. It's way better than Chipwrecked. You lie. You lie. <laughs> it is. I swear. Like the story comes out of nowhere. It should have been the third film instead of the fourth film. Like the story is way better. Like the, 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 it's more focused than well, the previous that your film. Hidden gems? No, my hidden gems are Turbo Kid and the Final Girls. And you're probably thinking, what the fuck are those films? Uh, so these are indie films, more or less, give or take. Turbo Kid is a Canadian New Zealand production. Yeah, it's more on my uh, turf. It's more specifically on my turf, actually. It is, it's a little bit, because it's an indie film, like. It's got some big names like Michael Ironside as the bad guy in it. It's basically a BMX version of Mad Max. It's set in the post-apocalyptic uh, year of 1997, I believe. They're paying homage to that era of films where they have the f films in the 90s being the futuristic kind of world. And it's it's like every it's like Mad Max times the 80s. Like it's all 80s music is in there. You have this kid who is surviving after his parents got killed, spoiler alert, and he uh, listens to 80 music, he reads a comic book called Turbo, uh, Turbo, fuck, what was it? It wasn't Turbo Man, it was something else, he reads a comic book, he admires it, and there's blood, there's gore, it gets bloody, there's a cowboy in there from, there's like an Australian cowboy, oh, for some reason, who arm wrestles. <laughs> Get the, well, it's weird because he he he's um, he's an arm he's wrestler. He's like he's, like, he, he's an arm wrestling champion in this film, and I can't remember the actor's name, but he he's an arm wrestling champion. Then it, his arm gets cut off. He gets a robotic hand, so it's like Captain Hook more or less, and it's just so mind-blowingly '80s. It's unbelievable. It's like you have Michael Ironside unrecognizable as this bad guy, and there's there's a couple of twists at the end of the film, which is worth. A check out, especially if you're into like post-apocalyptic films and the '80s genre, wait, and all that stuff. Uh, hold up, hold that thought right there, Michael. Iron, unrecognizable as a bad guy. The look, he looks, he doesn't look, he looks so different. You can't recognize him in the like. You could sort of see him, see his face, but he's so. How do I? His character. He's like bald. He's got an eye patch. You can't recognize his face, more or less, because you usually see him. It's, it was so. I was like, it took me a while. I was like, bald, hey, that's bald, Michael Ironside. Bald, bald, <gasps> my eyes, my eyes. <laughs> so that's what I mean by unrecognizable. Like, you, it takes me it took me a while to figure it out. But yeah, it's it's Michael Ironside playing a bad guy, of course, which he's excellent at oh my god but like i said there's a lot lots of blood like you see like arms get cut off heads chopped off you see this maniac with a mask on he's got like the saw like gun he's like psh, psh, psh. and it's like oh my god this is an indie film that you have to check out oh my god okay <clears throat> final girls the final girls is like it pokes fun at, at the slasher genre um it's actually kind of clever how they go into the movie and they see all the tropes and they pick at, you know, like, kind of riffing at the cheesy 80s lines. And it gets a little twisty and turny with, you know, the villain and how they see the movie. You know, it plays over and over and over. They realize that until, like, they do it two times. Like, oh, hour 30 minutes later, oh my god, it starts all over again. We're in the movie, oh my gosh. Um, the daughter, there's, a like, a connecting story with this female lead where she loses her mother her mother's in the slasher film she sees her in the film it's not her mother of course she's the the, the, the character who she played and it's got this heartwarming story between the her growing up you know gr growing as a character that is growing as a character like being not so shy but now turning into this badass who she's trying to live through this whole movie becoming the final girl you know and it's got all the 80s references. And this is the director who directed Harold Kumar's 3D Christmas. It's... Mm. If you like Last Action Hero and you want to see some of the slasher genre, it's way better than Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. Oh, yeah. Okay, so if you want a horror comedy, that's just definitely something you want to go into. 
Okay. You seem out of breath. I did that really quick. I didn't want to over talk about these two films. I remember after we tried watching Scott's Guide to, Guide to the Apocalypse, we you showed us the trailer for those. Yeah, movies I, and we're like, yeah. You um, guys were if, you guys were iffy about it because yeah. both movies shared like a selfie joke, but that selfie joke in uh, the uh, Final Girls had kind of like a thing they noticed. That's like a plot point, but yeah. Now it's just after one watching one of those two movies that we felt like the whole horror comedy was dead. Spoing, spoing, whoa, bro! I seriously have. Oh, Jeez. Uh, yeah, so if you uh, have not seen Turbo Kid or The Final Girls, it's definitely one of my two hidden gems you have to watch for 2015. Okay. And my, ch my choice uh, for the hidden gem... Uh, we didn't say that this had to be something that was playing in theaters, did we? No, I no, I I should have said that in the podcast. Yes, for 2015, it has to be either in theaters, on Netflix, or on television. So okay, well, <laughs> my pick for the uh, the hidden gem of the year, Morgan. Sing it with me now. Santa Claus Plus needs some love and Santa Claus wants some love and Uh yes. Here we have <laughs> uh you guys can do dinner and play bass. You're gonna go somewhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. Here we have a very Murray Christmas. Uh the the plot of this film, and it's it's pretty short actually. It's it's only about an hour long. Um, directed by Sofia Coppola. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a surprise. Sofia Coppola mm -hmm. directing something like this. It's uh, Bill Murray playing himself at uh, at a hotel in in New York at Christmas time. He's trying to put on. He, he's trying to put on a Christmas uh, broadcast uh, for for everybody in the New York area. The problem is is uh, nobody's watching, and the power goes out across the city because uh, because it's the biggest snowstorm uh, they've seen in recent years. You know that that type of story. So. Uh, there's, they're completely snowed in in this building, and so with, uh, so without, uh, an on-air audience to turn to, he instead turns to the people who are in the hotel, and it, it's kind of, it, it's kind of just, a uh, just a, a straight-up, uh, uh, music uh christmas tribute like they the kind of thing that they that they used to do on television all the time where they you don't really have anything that's that's heavy on story just uh have characters come in sing songs and whatnot and come out again only there is a very loose sense of story wrapped around this and it doesn't really have to make a, a hell of a lot of sense but it is it it is what it is, and it's it's very it's very entertaining and very funny at at times. Just to watch Bill Murray and the other and the other musical guests, uh, a very terrific performance by uh, the independent band Phoenix, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. who I'd never heard of before. They they come out and speaking of hidden gems, they have a a song performance that is. In and of itself, kind of a hidden gem. They took the uh, the band uh, Beach Boys. Yes, the the band uh, uh, shows up. They have this cameo as uh, as as cooks as this as the cooking staff in this hotel. And Bill Murray asks them to play something that that nobody knows, just sort of out of the blue. 
and they start singing an unreleased Christmas song by the Beach Boys uh, called Alone on Christmas Day, which um, which is, is kind of the, the, the centerpiece of this film because they have Paul Schaefer from uh, David Letterman on, on piano uh, accompanying this and Bill, Bill singing back up. And they, it, it's, it's just this, this charming uh, little short musical film that, uh, that, um, that, that just show, that just shows Christmas. That's, that's all it is. Mm. I, I saw this short, uh, too, and it was better than The Ridiculous Six. Um, I think the one hour running time fits pretty well because I sort of describe it as, like, an entertaining dry martini. When you really think about it, Christmas specials don't have to be overbearing, overblowing plots. They can be singing and dancing. And that's really all this is. It's just a bunch of musical performances. You don't really care much about the plot. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Um... The bits he did with George Clooney and Phoenix are pretty good, especially Buster Poindexter as the bartender, which is <laughs> ironic because he was Ghost Scrooge's past in Scrooge, so I thought it was pretty cute. I think it's pretty underrated, but if it was one Christmas movie, I was really disappointed to see that didn't make a huge, huge splash. It would be oh. crap. Oh. I am still on your asses because of this, and I'll explain in a second. <laughs> This is your hidden gem? My hidden gem is Krampus. It's directed by Michael Dowtry, who did Trick or Treat. Um, this is a Christmas story that I describe as being a mix between Poltergeist and It's Wonderful Life. You have a kid that's having a really rotten Christmas. His family is so dysfunctional, it's beyond Griswold standards. So he loses Christmas faith. Don't tempt me. Um, he loses Christmas faith. He... <laughs> And that's a sign of this monster to come in, terrorize the whole family, and drag them all to hell one by one. But not in just a traditional standard, no, no, just like Santa. He comes on the exact day to take them. And he does it in a very slow, very threatening, very menacing manner as the family has to deal with evil snowmen, killer toys, and demented elves, and cartoony gingerbread men that are edible, but also devious. Um, I like. Do they this. sound like Gary Busey? No, but they. But they sound better than the Chipmunks. Okay. Okay. You don't deserve the power of this film for not seeing it. Um, the movie was on a budget of fifteen million. The practical effects are done by Way to Workshop, and my God, they're impressive. This is a great breath of fresh air from all that CGI stuff. It shows that he can make an effective monster with actual an actual person, actual foam, and they just look amazing. Like, when you see these things attack the family, you're seeing actual monsters attacking the family. That's how impressive this movie is. Um, it's short, yeah, it's kind of basic, but the fact they're taking a traditional German mythology of the shadow of Santa being this devil that goes around and punishes kids, and taking it to a different extreme medium in a different interpretation, it's just really interesting to watch. And you're with these people, you want to see them live, even though you kind of have this feeling that they're going to die and stuff like that. And they're really such scene stealers. You get um, the the sportscaster from Anchorman who plays the the uncle with all the weaponry and stuff. You got the aunt who's like constantly getting drunk and throwing out one-liners. And in one key sequence, she teaches the kids how to make peppermint schnobs. <laughs> Uh, there's just there's just so much that's great that I want to ruin it. What makes this a hidden gem, in my opinion, is that I think there's one thing that Universal didn't do. And that's pursue pre-screening for critics. And I think that kind of harmed the film's success because it did well at the box office. It got $16 million on its opening weekend getting its budget back. And as we speak, it's already grossed $42 million. And I feel bad. I talked to the ticket lady who was running the theater that I went to see this movie, and even she was surprised. She kept describing this movie, and... Within the last four weeks up to Christmas Eve, not many people saw Krampus, and I was disappointed. I was there opening night. The kids were made of, like, pre-college students and high school people, and I was with my sister. We thought they were going to talk about the whole movie. No. When there was a funny moment, they laughed. When there was a scary moment, they were quiet. They were so quiet, you could hear a 
pin drop in that theater. And by the time it was over, I looked for my sister. We were glad nobody talked about the whole movie, but her reaction was, my God, that was interesting. I swear, you bring me to the weirdest shit. And then I just sat there with a cringe like grin going, I liked it. <laughs> it was nice seeing a Christmas movie that was demented, had no limitations, even though there were some limits, um, knew exactly what to do. Uh, again, I want to say it's Gremlins-esque, because a lot of people say it's Gremlins. I say it's, again, like Poltergeist meets One Full Life. Originally, I planned to do a three-way cinephone with Matt and James. I gave them money to see this movie, and due to complications, not getting a ride, trying to find the right theater, they didn't see the movie, so I'm the fool, I wasted $22 on these jackasses, and here I am defending this movie. So if this comes out in February, we're all getting together, we're experiencing the Krampus. That is all I'm saying. I'm not going to give away the ending because it is worth seeing, and is that we're keeping secret too? Fuck you too. Fuck you both for taking my money and seeing Star Wars, whatever bullshit you saw it with. Actually, I haven't used that money to see new movies yet. I'm surprised. The other one, on the other hand. <laughs> Matt? I have no regrets. Traitor! Traitor! Yes, traitor! 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 <laughs> traitor. <laughs> Oh man, alright. Next category. <sighs> if this comes out on DVD and Blu-ray, please do see it, people. For the love of God, make it a Christmas classic. I know you're gonna make us do it, so... Oh, it's gonna come, I know it. Alright, the next category is Guilty Pleasure. Guilty Pleasures! Everybody has a few... Uh, Matt, what do you got for Guilty Pleasure of 2015? We've already talked about this, but I was quiet during this whole time, but screw it. My Guilty Pleasure is... And it's what? <laughs> are you, are you <laughs> Movie. Everything is so wrong it ends up being right. The 2015 time for Hitler. It really is. Oh my God. <laughs> time for Hitler, you asshole. <laughs> 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 nothing in this is right. No, absolutely nothing. It starts out with this freaking roll doll story with this over the top evil nun, and then like there was a transition that I told you, and then like we we see a cowboy Captain Hook, and they're trying to do this romance thing with Hook and Tiger Lily, which she wear, which is it's this. They're not natives. They're like this multicolored Whoville land that it's like. <laughs> It's like everything is freaking knitted, and she wears this giant wig that, like, she it's like it's all knitted and stuff like that. I was expecting a little thing to come out going, eh. It's like a and then, dress. Like, no, there's nothing here. But, and also, whatever it has to do with the freaking original J.M. Barry story, it's like completely thrown out the window. It's absolutely stupid. Nothing is wrong, but the way. It is so over the top and so messed up. It's just so enjoyable. I was laughing and I was enjoying the ride throughout this whole time. It's a box of surprises. And even nowadays, I'm starting to quote it. Like, sometimes, like, when I would be ready for something, I would actually go out, It's time for the pain. <laughs> it's just so hilarious. And, like, Hugh Jackson's performance is so crazy and over the top. Because I got a feeling that, okay, the biggest explanation of why it would suck, I got a feeling is probably because it's no one give, gave a single crap. Everybody knew for a fact that this is an obvious cash in to the trend that Disney is doing with Maleficent and Alice in Wonderland. They knew that the script is pure freaking garbage, so they decided to do whatever the hell they want. The director didn't care, none of the actors cared, and my god, they were just have and they knew how to have so much fun with it, especially Hugh Jackman and whoever played that nun. I gotta give them major props. 
Well, oh, the I script. Hope I hope we're best friends, Captain Hook. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the script for this, uh, Morgan, you you actually brought up the fact that it was from the the blacklist. Yes, a selection of unproduced screenplays that are generally favored and have yet to be picked. Mm-hmm. Uh, how how? But. Uh, <laughs> But the uh, the thing is, when I was watching this, it was, yeah, it, it was bad, but it was kind of, I was thinking, this is, this is to Peter Pan, what Nutcracker, the untold story, was to Nutcracker, except whereas that film was mean-spirited and ugly on the, on the underneath side, despite all the effort that was put into it, and... And everyone, like you said, Matt, not giving a crap. Uh, this is, um, at the end of the day, kind of, uh, kind of not mean spirited. Kind of, uh, it, no, it, it's, it's just bad. But it's kind of like, okay, are are you in the mood for this kind of bad today? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. No, because it's like it's bad. But like I said, everybody had freaking fun with it. They just had, it, it, It's kind of. A, it's almost like um, it's almost like an army of darkness level where they decided to just enjoy, like just it's, have the best it's, time. You know, of following. <laughs> yeah, I compared it to army of darkness a lot. No, 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 well, it was nice knowing you, Matt. I'm gonna go and friend you. Oh, fuck you, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, okay. What did I say? No, well, are we a dark? No, <laughs> the all joking is. These are two different extremes here. One's a kids movie. One is a Sam Raimi movie. No, but <laughs> no, but are we a darkness? It was awesome, regardless. The hat is off. Hey, but no, but hey, it is true that the that. That that like Bruce Campbell and the rest of the cast like they decided to wing it and have fun with it. Is that true? Is it true? Morgan, Morgan, did they did Bruce Campbell and the cast have a lot of fun during Army of Darkness? Mike, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. I just want to see your reaction to that. Uh, yes, but I spoiled this a little early in the game, but I say Terminator Genesis was my guilty pleasure. I kind of liked it. Everybody else hated it. Uh, it. Okay. Very guilty. I, I was very guilty. I like, like I said, I saw the movie after we talked about um, on for the Terminator episode last year. I saw it at the theater. I was alone watching it. Which was, was just kind of cool. I was like sitting there all to myself, just watching this film. And I'm just like, "Huh, good action. Uh, not so bad portrayals. Uh, great homages to the first and second film. Uh, the 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 big uh, meet up between young Arnold and old Arnold was pretty cool. Um, seeing Matt Smith uh, being the alternate dimension human form of Skynet." Grabbing John Connor, becoming making him a Terminator. That was a nice little twist. Even though it's spoiled in the trailer, it was just poof, kind of a waste. It would have been nice to see it fresh-minded in theaters. Like, oh my god, that was a huge twist. Um, great action. There was like this point where the bus flips over on the bridge. Oh my god, that was like a nice bus flip. It's just, it's way better than Salvation and freaking Rise of Machines for fuck's sake. I agree with James Cameron. I mean. It's, it should be the third film in the franchise. It's just... I enjoyed it. That makes it. no sense. That would make no sense if it was the third film in the franchise. Because the, that thing makes sense. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. Fine, no. I was just saying, it's just like... It, it doesn't... I don't know. I don't know what they were going for, but I enjoyed every second of it as I was watching it. It was just... It's it's something I don't know. I always say you take your turn your brain off sometimes when you watch the movie, and this is the time where I actually turned that off because nothing made sense, but I was enjoying it while it was happening. Okay. And I was kind of, so. I remember when we, after we came after we came out of the the Terminator episode of the podcast, 
We, uh, after both Morgan and I railed on it and everything, you saw it, you said you liked it, and you were, you were ready to, to challenge us, to debate yes. us over Facebook. Yes. And we both had better things to do. And exactly, and it was it was like what 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 is the deal, Mike? What is the it's deal? Like, it's like why would you just shame it? Why is that? You need to. I I didn't want to just shame it. It was shameable, in my opinion. You it's can that, you can like the film. I don't you, know. I just wanted to just be like, hey, bring it on. I liked it. You didn't, but whatever. Well, you could at least wait until we were available to have this this conversation. I, I could have waited. I could have. But I was like, after I was fresh in mind, I was like, all right, let's do it now. But mm -hmm. I fucking loved it. The guilty pleasure of the year. Fair enough. Fair, fair enough. I, I'm, I'm not going to debate that. Uh, my guilty pleasure. <laughs> Very guilty. Pick souls. And that's why I didn't pick it, because I knew you were picking Pixels, though. So. Yes. Yes. I went with Pixels. I, because... It's my, it's, it's my guilty pleasure, too. Yeah. I agree with you. It, it's, uh... It, it's... It's... It's dumb. But, you know, we got the premise... You got a premise of uh, Adam Sandler and his... And his, uh... His lifelong gamer buds... I'll uh, I'll form this team to uh, to take on an alien invasion that's made up of that's made up of giant pixelated video game characters from the 1980s. Um, I just this was one where I shut my brain off, then said, "Okay, it's kind of like it's kind of like goosebumps in the in a sense where the only enjoyability here is." If you read the books and you are a fan enough that you actually, uh, that you actually identified every monster coming on screen, well, I'm a gamer. I've I've liked games all my life, so mm -hmm. so for me, this is. I don't care if they're the bad guys. I don't care if the aliens invasion plan makes no sense whatsoever. I don't, I don't see why they would consider uh, a message from humanity as some sort of threat that they had to fight against. Um, but I, I just, I just thought it was funny, you know, watching, mm -hmm. watching, uh, giant Pac-Man and giant Donkey Kong and, and mm -hmm. even the, the paper boy at one point just, just makes a flyby appearance. It's, uh, mm -hmm. what, what, what all these game characters have in common? Nothing. Qbert, nothing. Uh, it, it, it was very shut your brain off and, and just just sort of laugh at it and, and poke fun. Yeah, it's, it's got, a, like I said, a lot of 80s nostalgia. It's got all the music and the references. Even the messages that Alien sends are just like superimposed like Max Headroom or Hollow Notes, and it was like, oh, wow. It was just... The, yeah, it was very, like... I enjoyed it really much. It's like one of the better Adam Sandler films I've seen. Mm -hmm. And so... Who's next? Morgan? He start off by saying, congratulations, Matt, your unfriending was spared thanks to the flip of the coin. Yay! Oh. I was legit gonna do it. Really? Oh. Yeah! Oh! Oh! oh. 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 <laughs> Yikes! Yeah. Wow! Wow! Now it just Sorry. got dark. Sorry. Ooh. So it was hard for me because I couldn't think of a film where I felt like, yeah, it's bad, but I enjoy it because, well, I didn't really see those kind of movies this year, so on a random whim, I ended up with absolutely anything. The one movie that has yet to come over to the States, even though it's over in Britain, which is weirdly getting panned, I don't think it's that bad. I think the main problem with absolutely anything is that it's a one-trick premise that they're doing as a setup for, like, a random string of gags. Mm -hmm. And the gags, they have great ideas, they have great potential, but they're sort of not really doing much of a build-up or anything in the world, even though they do, but 
not to a huge effect like, say, Bruce Almighty, where it causes the end of the world, save for one sequence where Summon Peg tries to fix all the world problems, like the ozone layer, war, and everything. Um, so the whole premise is about these aliens voiced by the Python troop. And they're planning to destroy Earth, but they say, oh wait, let's do our usual test where we pick a random person and give absolutely the power to do absolutely anything they wish to, to see if they know the difference between good or evil, and they randomly pick Simon Peg, right after they were about to consider Sarah Palin, and actually, yeah, not too bad joke. Um, you got... Robin Williams in his final voice role as a talking dog. This is a scene where he gives his dog actual um, rational thinking and gives him the talk. And there's some really nice jokes, some really nice ideas in here, but they sort of again feel like a couple of sketches strung together. And they're not bad jokes, but I just wish there was more of a constant narrative going on most of the time. But for what it is, it's a harmless film. I'd say if it comes over here on DVD or Netflix, Please do see it. It's a harmless movie. And considering all the crappy comedies I had to sit through, it's really not that bad. You don't get the annoying shouting from Hot Pursuit. You don't get the right prison jokes from Get Hard. It's an actual trying to be a good hearted, not that bad comedy. I laughed at it. I love the stuff they did with it. Terry mm -hmm. Jones directed it. He's not a bad guy. Give it a break. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I I watched it in the same group with with Morgan, and I mm -hmm. I, I think Robin Williams, uh, God rest his soul, really steals uh, the show in every scene that he's mm -hmm. that he's yeah, in. I'm sorry. I can't think of those two things. Biscuits. <laughs> Those biscuits. biscuits. You are my master. I will do everything. And I, I was just sort of thinking while while uh, while listening to say master, I just wanted them to break out and say, "You ain't never got a friend like me." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. Well, yes. No, I remember why I didn't like the film that much. There's that side. There's that subplot where he's pining for a girl, but the girl's being stalked by her ex. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, they, yes, that, and I didn't. They could have so why, easily done without that. Yeah, that's why I didn't like it because the, the the stupid like conflict between the ex, whatever boy played by Robbie Rist is like, Stop. oh no, no, no. It's like, I mean, Kate Beckinsale is great in it, but it's just like that subplot. There's like, why is that there? You know, you could have Simon Pegg pining for Kate Beckinsworth, and that would have been fine. But no, you got to bring that conflict in there. And then he captures him, tries to use his power and stuff, and I guess the wishes are kind of amusing, but it's like, you don't need it. Get rid of it. You, it, it's, no. you, you got your best friend being worshipped like Jesus. I think that's fine alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, that, otherwise, it's, it's, otherwise it's a good movie. Yeah. Besides the fact. Behold the car of... <laughs> Ray. Behold the car of Ray. <laughs> and then they try uh, to see if he can resurrect. They have like the hanging nooses and everything. That was brilliant. Oh man, that was good. All right, last two categories are big. The big ones: worst and favorite film. We're gonna first go with our worst film of 2015. Matt, what do you got? Hands down, absolutely one. Of, not only one of the worst movies of this year, but one of the worst animated films of the freaking decade. Strange Magic. My <laughs> God, is this one horrible? Yes. It, the, the the biggest issue is that the writing is absolutely freaking garbage. There was no thought or care put into it. It's some of the most cliched, bore, like cliched, stupid things about like with love and all that stuff the characters are freaking moronic as hell like they're either absolutely bland or they're absolutely dumb as a freaking post and not like the good kind of stupid like th this is like frustratingly stupid and the use of songs it is insulting because like it's the most randomest choices for songs it it's a jukebox musical and like unlike happy feed where at least like the songs that they picked, they made it like they made it a great musical number. Each one of them passes out as this absolutely bland pop song that it feels like uh, it's nothing but um, a w like it, it feels like taking the worst elements of High School Musical and Glee and put them all together in this dumb fantasy film. And especially even in the, in the animation where it's executed very well, 
like the concepts alone, like from the designs and stuff like that, they look like they were ripped off from something like uh, Blue Skies Epic or Arthur and the Invisibles. It's freaking garbage. I, I never came out of the theater so pissed off of how poorly done a movie was since Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2. It really was that bad. It, it, it's just, it was, and I deemed it as, as the worst thing that ever came out of George Lucas's head. And people are trying to defend it, saying that, well, George Lucas didn't write it, George Lucas didn't direct it. I didn't say that. He thought of the freaking idea ever since, like, uh, the, the Star Wars prequel. He wanted this to be, like, the Star Wars for girls. And that's his, that, that's quotes from him. And it came out freaking garbage. It's just a total waste. It was aggravating as hell. It, and, like, even the message of love that is trying to pass out is freaking garbage. This is nothing but a garbage filled movie. You know what the sad thing is? What? Because of this film, I bet there's no way they're going to get him to direct episode 9 of Star Wars. No. Oh, God, that petition. No. That stupid petition. Oh Let's my leave God. it at People... that. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, like, all credibility for me of George Lucas is completely thrown out the window ever since I saw that film. Ugh. Hmm. Yeah. Anybody else Ugh. seen it? Nope. nope. Not, not yet, but, uh... I might, oh, I might see God. it after the podcast, though. <laughs> oh, jeez. <sighs> I want to see how bad it is. God. Oh, okay, it might, might be a new hurt. guilty pleasure. They, 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 got a, they got a troll that looks like Logan. That could be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Shots oh. fired! <laughs> Burn! <laughs> you move, Toon Mort! <laughs> Seriously, did anyone not see that in the trailer? He looks exactly <laughs> like him! Oh my god, I never thought of that! <laughs> uh... <laughs> he does! <laughs> I swear I'm not crazy! Oh my god, he acts like him too. It's so bizarre. <laughs> and now we're back on the same page, Matt. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh yeah, you get it. <laughs> Mike, your worst film? My worst film is Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. God, I hated this movie so much. It wasn't funny. It had some crude humor that I... Oh, they had dicks and boobies. Oh, that was funny. Oh, zombie boobies. Oh, that's good. Oh, a zombie dude with a long... Old geezer with a long dick. What the fuck? It's... It, it, I didn't like it. It just... It, it wasn't funny. It was so stupid. I mean, I've seen a lot of zombie movies, and this just takes the cake. Ah. Oh. You still I, haven't seen Zombie Lake. I, it is still the reigning champion of the worst, but this is pretty I, bad. I, yeah, I wasn't phased by this movie either. I knew what I was going into. I didn't get any bad taste vibes. So I was like, I've seen way too many bad comedies. I knew what I was in for. I just took it for what it was. Mm -hmm. The Ridiculous Six. I wish I had the opportunity to shut that off. It, it was just... I, I, I like I like crude humor, but it just didn't they didn't like play it out right in my head. It was just like that didn't come off as funny. It just I mean I give them props for the 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 final act where they come out all decked out as badasses within this in the dance and it's all strobe lights and it's got dark. That's a nice scene and all, but everything else is just like. Hmm. <laughs> Wiener badge. Uh, 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 uh. That's not how you eat a hot dog. Yeah, this. If you want. Uh, this film, I, uh, I had the very unique, uh, I had the very unique experience of, uh, of actually feeling a laugh generate in itself from my lungs, travel up the windpipe, and die as it came out my mouth. That's wow. I was a you and you guys um, were all a witness when I when that yes. happened. Wow, yeah, I remember that. I had oh, wow. I had I I had a zombie laugh. It was a laugh that was dead. Wow, see? That's a testament of how this movie is. When, when I mean 
When your movie has a zombie singing Britney Spears, you know it's going to train wreck. Oh, God, yes. That's... Oh, jeez, I had to flack that out of my head. Oh, Every, God, no. Everything, everything that Shaun of the Dead did right, this movie does wrong. Yes. That's how to do. That's you. just how to put it in a nutshell. Thank you. And when Thank you have you. your finale that's ripping off Brain Dead, okay, do the finale, but don't have so many strobes. That doesn't make it exciting. That makes it hard to watch. Uh, yeah. See, like, seize your like, warning on this flick. They got like weed whackers and the kill is always like, okay, this is a good idea. What do they do? They fill it with like flashing lights and everything. Thank you. Yeah, but. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Blech. James, what's your worst? My worst? Well, we already talked about Tomorrowland. Uh, but there, uh, for my for my case of the worst, it has to go to the Lazarus effect. This is here. We have a film you guys probably have not heard of, but I sat down. I watched it with LT over over at his place for Halloween just because we had to binge watch a bunch of scary movies. I thought this might look cool. Um, you guys remember? You guys remember Hollow Man? Oh yeah, the movie sucked. Aside from Ron Amerta's cameo. Well, imagine the same, the same premise, the exact same premise of a uh, of a group of uh, a group of people, a group of scientists trying to figure out the the secret to doing something. They lose. Uh, they lose their funding from the the college that they're working for, and and so they decide to go ahead and take whatever research it is that they have, and just uh, just go with it and try to activate their experience, activate their experiment, and then their experiment goes wrong. Well, that's that's the. That's the premise to uh, to Hollow Man, and at least with the case of Hollow Man, it was kind of enjoyable and had some terrific special effects and whatnot. Um, this this was uh, instead of invisibility, instead of unlocking uh, the the secret to invisibility, this movie is uh, unlocking the secret to uh, uh, bringing the dead back to life. And it, um, it, it manages to just be that bland and unexciting. Uh, the, the, the laughing, the, uh, the acting is laughable. The, the plot was, like, the plot was so easily taken from another source, it was, it was painful. Um, it, except you, 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 at the very least, they don't just have the have the the leader of the experiment who dies come back as just a straight up zombie there's there's something that's remotely intelligent but they just sort of because the plot said so because science is evil in this sense this person goes crazy over time and uh there's there's a bit where a dog actually comes back now here's where things was things were really confusing a dog comes back to life uh, but, um, that dog never comes back into play. They, once this, once this miracle happens and the, it, we just briefly see signs of the dog starting to, to turn feral or whatever, it never comes back into play. And I was like, what happened to the dog? Uh, hey, I, guess... I didn't mean to cook your dog, but they those things just happen. Mine was just standing there, and so those they started tapping. So I got his throat, and I go get your goat, and then I put him on the barbecue. Yeah. So, Lazarus effect looked kind of cool, um, and and just because you pull a your the title of your movie out of the Bible doesn't mean it's going to be good. Just uh, for future reference. Yeah, I know we talked about this earlier, but I don't care. My pick for worst film, I was going to do Fantastic Four, but I already picked Adaptation last year with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And Fantastic Four at least had one or two things that I was okay with, like Jimmy Bell is the thing. But 
for me, this movie, it enraged me, and that goes to Chappie. <laughs> really? Uh, let me talk about the things that he oh, didn't talk oh, about. Boy. So it's so forgettable. So this machine they create it has the mind of rational thinking, and yet Sigourney Weaver, head of the um, whole technology basis, rejects it. What? You go with weapons over an actual thinking thing? An actual mechanical human being? You And I'm not kidding here. You go for Hugh Jackman and his, oh, let's make all these weapons to take over South Africa and all that sort of stuff. It's that kind of thing. And these characters are not smart. We get these thugs who are so stupid they make the wet bandits smart. They're like, hey, let's hold this guy for ransom because, and I quote, he has all the remotes to the robots, so he controls all the robots and is able to shut him down. Do you even read? I mean, you watch He-Man, Master of the Universe, constantly in your weird garage basement, remember? But do you know who this guy is? He, Ben's robots, he doesn't want to turn him off or anything. So they kidnap him, they take the robot, they boot him up, the robot has the mind of a six-year-old, and so the interest in the gang life, and I guess it's supposed to be uh, a message about rural life and how that nature versus nurture can affect it, but because it becomes so uncomfortable to watch and so unpleasant with this mind of a six-year-old character in the slums getting tossed around and torn up, there's not a single character to even like here, um... And then it becomes ugh, Avatar, then District 9, it becomes Short Circuit, AI Artificial Intelligence, all these other movies, especially that last third where Chappie figures out how to transfer actual minds into different bodies, like, like robotic bodies, and that it becomes Avatar! Just like with District 9. And I feel like this director wants to make movies in South Africa and show the culture and how rural and everything, fine. But I think it'd be better if he did it as documentaries, not stories. Because when you're doing a story, there has to be a narrative and a point to it. Message should come last. But these characters are so unlikable, uninteresting, unfocused. It's just a pain to watch. And it's the biggest controversy, and this is the reason why I didn't do a blog about it. Because I'm the only person in my family that actually did not like Chappie highly. Hands down, I am the odd duck here. Hell, when I go to my barber, who's very defensive about the films she's seen, hell, she still wants my head for not liking Green Lantern. Whenever I bring up Chappie, and how I really hate it, she's ready to pummel me. Yeah. She, 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 she's that really, really big on opinion. Oh, so, gee, well... Yeah. It's not worth getting pummeled over Chappie. So, so that's Chappie why, had enough punishment. So that's why when I... Exactly. So that's when I talk about films around her, I gotta be hush-hush, but... My pick for the year, Chappie, it's the worst I experienced. It, it, it's by far. You know, honestly, I'm really surprised that you said that, considering that you have seen The Ridiculous Six. And I was ready for you to talk about it, but with Chappie? Oh, boy. <laughs> didn't know it was that bad. I, I didn't want to choose Netflix movies because it would be very unfair and too easy. Yeah. And, and Adam Sandler does not deserve to be talked about. Yeah, that's no. true. I no. forgot that Hugh Jackman was in this movie. This is... Oh, yeah. not a good movie for. <laughs> oh no, he he played the evil bad guy from Avatar, who's trying to take over, and he has that big freaking machine that shoots up and stuff that's taken from Robocop. So this is like many <coughs> sci-fi movies in one. This so was not a good movie. This was not a good year for for Hugh Jackman. <laughs> no. Okay, so guys, and, which and one was... did you enjoy? Hugh Jackman, the bad the bad cop in uh, Chappie, or Hugh Jackman, the not Captain Hook in Pan? Blackbeard. Blackbeard. Okay. Yeah, Blackbeard. And at least Hugh Jackman was fun, and this one he's trying to be gritty, tough as nails, and it's it's been done before. It's mm. stupid. You know he's going to be the Lee Army, full metal jacket kind of guy that's trying to drive the military stuff. It's boring. And at least with Ridiculous uh, 6, I laughed three times, and I'd rather see those three moments I laughed at more than Chappie. Mm-hmm. It is a miserable movie. 
dreadful. It's bad. Stupid. Alrighty then, we're on to the last but not least, our favorite hey, film. Your... Mike, what about your worst movie? He said it was Scouts. Scouts guy. Oh right. I Scouts guy. It's a zombie apocalypse. Right. Shoo! Most forgettable. It goes the mat. Yeah. Um. Uh, last category is our favorite film, the best film of 2015 for us. Uh, Matt, what is your favorite film of 2015? Hands down, beautiful film. Absolutely gorgeous, Inside Out. Yay! Because the thing is, is that in this day and age, in this decade of feature films, where it's over-pummeled by uh, sequels, follow-ups, spin-offs, and all that kind of stuff, here we have this beautifully original animated feature that pretty much brought back the glory of what Pixar like what Pixar pretty much is and um, with with Inside Out I gotta say like the concept is just so well thought thought out and put together that pretty much explains something that everybody can relate to and a, a core idea that um, everybody can understand like I said relate and it really brings out some very com some very complex characters, especially with Riley, how we go inside her head and what's been going on, especially uh, during a period where she's going through a very tough. Sorry, it's my stomach. Uh, she's going through a very tough time just moving into a new environment. That's already hard. So now we see inside the mind of what is going on. And, like, uh, just even the transition of animation, like, where in, in the real world it's more realistic, but in uh, inside her head it's more colorful, it's more uh, cartoony, like, in well done animation all around. It's just, everything is just well thought out and put together, and they thought out of so many great ideas of what goes inside the mind from imaginary friends, how imagination works, where, with dreams, and all that kind of stuff. Every core idea just works, and even the story really fall like it follows through very well. And even the message at the end, there was at one point we talked about how there was a movie that didn't work where we need the joy with the sadness. Oh yeah, for Tomorrowland, Morgan, you brought it up. This one works. This is the message where it actually is spot on with that message. How like that we need the sadness in order to have the joyous moments. Like how sadness is an important role, and it's just. Everything about it, it just works. It's just so beautifully well done. And it's it's that small moment to remind us why Pixar is great. Even though we got many sub subpar Pixar films like Cars 2 and Monsters University, this one is like definitely one of Pixar's best. It's just amazingly good. Oh yeah, this is the one in this is the one Pixar film in recent uh in recent years that we actually came out of the theater, you know, me and the whole family and said, yeah, I'd buy that. We have yet to because uh, this past Christmas season we decided not to get any Christmas presents amongst the family members. So there was no debate over uh, who was going to get who inside out. But I always, I always liked, um, I, when you, when you start, uh, when you sit down and try to explain this movie to a friend, uh, you actually start to appreciate uh, how how deep it is. You know, joy and sadness are are not present in the main frame, so so the other emotions have to try and pretend like they're joy, and uh, and and say stuff. You know, uh, so uh, Riley's parents ask her. Uh, so how was your day? And disgust, trying to be joy, responds with fine. And and you you sit down and you describe it like that, and you say, wait a minute, that's that's called sarcasm. Disgust, trying to be joy, is sarcasm. Yeah, that's that true. What was that? That was nothing like joy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they. Uh, it it is it is a very it it is a very s subtly deep film, and you have to stop, sit back, and think about it, and just be like, oh yeah, there's more than five emotions, but when you break it down, you can easily just mix and match these five emotions and come up with a whole whirlwind of, of possibilities. Oh, what a lovely day! What a lovely day! Knew you were gonna say this. What's a lovely day? 
<laughs> what a lovely day. Uh, yes, this is the film I was most anticipating for 2015, and it's instant favorite for me. It's Mad Max Fury I live, Road. I die, I live again. This, I, I, once I saw the trailer for this, I was like, I am sold. Give me my money. Let's, I saw it in the theaters in 3D. It was, uh, it was a quite an experience. Uh, my god, it looks so beautiful. The film is so gorgeous to look at. Like, the cinematography, they brought back, uh, I think George Miller had this cinematographer and he retired, but they brought him back out of retirement just to do this film. And it looks so beautiful. And the colors, oh my god, the colors. You got, you know, the, the, the hue of you know, like yellows and then you got hints of like blues and reds when they shoot off those uh flares and then the storm oh my god the storm storm scene oh my god the sandstorm is like the best scene in the film it's like it look, it's, a, it's, it's a big car chase scene and the story is so simple and you need simple stories sometimes because sometimes you, for me, I need action and the this continuous car chase just and the action is practical. Most of it's practical. And they had stunt people and you see cars explode, you see these people jumping off these things and you see these guys on poles swinging back and forth and it's just like choreographed so beautifully. And George Miller, he's like seventy in his seventies and he still knows how to direct movies. This is like his big comeback after, you know, the Happy Feet movies. This is like his mega opus Besides the other three Mad Max films, it's like, oh my god, it's like, I think it's a little dirty, but after I saw it, I kind of orgasmed in my pants, I was just like, oh, that's some good shit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, you, you showed me your top, you showed me your top favorite films of all time uh, list after... After seeing this, and I, I noticed Fury Road was at the top, and I was like, it, it was just released. I know you, I know you're really crazy yeah. about this film right now, but yeah. it, it's just, it's yep. just released. So this is, yeah, what, your it's, absolute it's, it's, favorite film of all time, yes. all of a sudden. Yep. And so, and so when all of us got to, around to watching, Mark sent me a copy of it. I still have that copy on my flash drive. I keep watching it every time I chance. It's like. It's rewatchable, and it's like, I don't have to buy a copy of it. I have a copy on my computer, thanks to Morgan. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't... Oh, man, I can't wait to... See... Mm -hmm. Can't wait to see what comes next from George Miller, because, my God, masterful. I... I'm going to... I'm going to say this was a really tough... This was just a, a really tough category for me. I don't know if I had a favorite film of 2015. Right. I because every film that we that I liked, we've already talked about. Um, it would be we could talk about Star Wars, but that would be too easy. Um, and I and as enjoyable as that film was, I think I did have better fun with other movies like. Inside Out, Peanuts. Um, I uh, with the new Star Wars, I still have to to let that one sit in just a little bit. Fury Road was amazing. Um, all the all these movies that we've all these great movies that we've we've talked about already. Um, the only film that I like that that hasn't been brought up yet is Spectre, which I'm just gonna say. I'm gonna say I enjoyed it because uh, I, I can't again. Not saying this is a favorite film of the year. No, no, it's understandable. It's, you know what you mean. It's a, but it is a. It was a enjoyable film for me because. Um, I'll allow it. I'm a lifelong Bond fan. I. Uh, I. Uh, well, if my life uh, started in middle school, that is. But um, I can't complain there. I I've been a big fan most of my life, and what what I enjoy about the Daniel Craig Bond films as they mature over time is the reintroduction of of classic elements 
such as Spectre, the organization that he used to, that James Bond used to to fight against in the earlier films. This was a this was a a great way to reintroduce that uh, that type of organization for for uh, the 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 folks now who seem to like gritty Bond more than campy Bond. Um, I uh, I and there were cliched moments in here. There were there were characters. Uh, there were characters that I, I was waiting to see again that finally made their comeback. Um, there was a cat that came back. Yay. Um, so, yeah. It, uh, I'd say that one I enjoyed, and I noticed the timer. Morgan? My favorite movie of the year goes to the Hateful Eight. <laughs> <laughs> Knew he was going to say that. My oh, my man. God, I I love this movie. I I freaking love this movie. You have these eight people, eight really despicable people, who gather around. They're stuck in a lodge. There's a blizzard outside, and you know shit is gonna go down. They're gonna backstab each other. They're gonna question each other. They don't know if they're gonna trust one each other. It's a beautifully filmed movie, very well done. It's like a spaghetti western meets an added Christine mystery along with a little bit of Clue the movie, minus the alternate endings and stuff. There's a lot of great twists and turns. I'm going to leave it at that, because what I really love about the movie so much is A, Quentin Tarantino's directing. B, the movie is shot in Ultra Pan 70mm. So you get like this very wide aspect ratio, like it's a Mad Men Mad World, Ben Herb. And the, the fun of it all that really helped me out, too, was, again, as you can see here, the movie was presented in a rare roadshow format, where they would, you know, treat a movie like a Broadway event. They have an overture, 12-minute intermission, and an, an entrance to the second act, and exit music. Um, you go in, you get dressed up, have reserved seating, get these nice little programs right here, nice seating, and it was just a blast to watch. I... I miss seeing a movie, an actual film. The last movie I saw on film was The Wolfman by Joe Johnson. Like, in, in the, on, on celluloid film, you see detail, you see depth, you see clarity. In a digital projected movie, uh, being projected digitally, it's sort of like a very flat painting. It's like Mona Lisa minus the depth. No, this is actual film. You see, like, the details in Samuel Jackson's forehead, you see actual details in the beard and everything. It looks great. And... Being in that theater, when they point guns at you, or if you're in this room, or if you're outside these landscapes, when you're in the carriage, you feel like you're part of the movie. That's how amazingly, beautifully shot this film is. So if you're going to see this film, for love of God, see it in the roadshow version. If you can't, you can still see the digital projected version. It's still a great movie on its own. But for the love of God, it's not just a movie, it's an experience. See the film version for what it is. Uh, the theater I went to was in Boston. It was Somerville Theater. A little shout out to you guys. And it was great. It was nice being there. Refurbished 1900 Theater. At the concession stand, they had homemade ice cream, so it was a really good opportunity to try that out. So here I am during intermission getting two scoops of peppermint. I go to my seat. Act 2 begins. I'm eating it. Keep playing. <laughs> Long story short, the minute I was finished my ice cream, the next two bodies dropped and I felt, oh, good timing. So I had a fun time. It was an hour drive to the theater, but I didn't care. The movie was great. My sister loves it. There's a nice running gag we have around the house now. Because in the movie, the door breaks down. They have to nail it shut with two boards. So every time our door seriously opens, my sister yells, Two boards! You gotta use two boards to nail it shut! <laughs> Uh -huh. well, please see this movie. It's great. I'm not gonna say anything else because I'm not gonna... No, it's all about the experience Samuel, and all about Samuel that. Samuel Jackson is great. Kurt Russell is a great John Wayne impersonist, and it works out fine. To anyone who says this movie sexist, shut up. There's a reason why it's called The Hateful Eight because everyone is so despicable. You want to see who lives or dies. Yeah, they... And... And, uh, two words. Black dingus. That is all. <coughs> I am...
I'm leaving out there. Uh, all right. Tarantino, you finally nailed the Western. Bravo. Derek, here do you nail the Western with Django? What are you talking about? Oh, no. No, no, no. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 I didn't want to say it, man. You said it. Oh, my God. J Django, Django was just a... Was just a standard Quentin Tarantino film placed in in Western times. This I this I sat back and watched, and with all the the shots and how everything was captured, it still yeah it still felt it it still uh, had those Tarantinoisms like the over usage of language and and blood and gore and guts. But the white shot, boy, white boy, get up, white boy. <laughs> Yeah, nothing but nothing but racism. Name me name me one film that he does that he does that doesn't have some form of racism in it. True romance. He didn't actually direct it, but uh, it it oh. does it does have. Oh well, yeah, there is some stuff that could be considered racism in that. My point being, uh, you look at the. You look at the uh, the shots and the way that they're done, the the glorious uh, mountainsides and everything, you, and just the way that the tension and suspense is panned out, you get a feeling like this is a western. Watch, go back, watch a classic western, a spaghetti western, good, the bad, the ugly. Sit down and watch that, and then watch this after the after that, and tell me you do not get the same type of vibe. That has been our look over retrospective of 2015. If there's films that we missed, of course, we're sorry. Please leave your comments below of what you think of 2015 in cinema. Of course we missed oh, movies. Man. This is why nobody... Well, I'm sure there's going to be one person who's going to mention, like, since we we all did the worst of 2015, somehow we didn't pass through Gem and the Holograms. I never, I didn't see it. They pulled the theaters too quick. No, I did. Nobody, nobody did that. saw it. Yeah, That's it, the thing. Universal nobody made sure this. that nobody saw it. <laughs> oh, orgasm. <laughs> oh, this has been Cinema Royale. Oh my god. Oh, this has been a great start to a brand new year. Ha Happy New Year. 2016 is upon us. Oh, man. I've, this is like the most I've try to prep for an episode. I'm just so exhausted after this. Watching so many films in 2015, it's unbelievable. This next time going to be a little bit more simpler. It's going to be Matt, James, and I. We're just going to focus on an actor. We're going to focus on Robert Downey Jr. since his new movie, Dirty Grandpa, is coming out in two weeks. Oh, wait, Robert Downey Jr.? I thought it was Robert De Niro. Yeah. Tune in next week when we Robert, discuss Robert Robert De Niro and his finest performance when he was a cabbage in Sesame Street. I remember that. Robert De Niro. Yeah. And he was Robert all alone in the dark. I'm a, cab I'm a cabbage. You know, I'm, 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 I'm good for you. I'm, I'm full of vitamins and minerals. If they need that sketch like, longer, yeah, you know exactly who you turn to next. I'm a munchkin. <laughs> I'm a munchkin. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh my God! What are we, Ma? I couldn't care I less. Care less. <laughs> yes, Robert God. De Niro. Sorry, sorry. It's Robert De Niro. De Niro. De Niro. I always forget. There's so many Roberts in the freaking world. Ah, De Niro. Yes, De Niro. So we will be talking a bunch about Robert De Niro films, just the three of us. And until next time, long live cinema. Thanks for listening, and goodbye. See you later, dudes. Not for now. Han Solo dies! Okay, bad news, gang. It looks like as if they shifted the release date of Jungle Book Origins. Next year? October 2017. So they could have more okay. time special effects. Ah. And so as not to coincide with the uh, the giant that is Disney. But they won't Probably. tell you that. I mean, they, uh, yeah, that's they, uh, 
Christian Bale is Bakira. Oh God. Benedict Cumberbatch is Sheer Khan. Kate Blanket. I mean, Kate Blanchett is Ka. Andy Serkis is Blue. Naomi Harris as Nisha. Tom Hollander as Tabakoyi. Probably a character from Globe Trotter. Oh, wants to see oh, Teenage no. Mutant Ninja Turtles oh, 2 with me. No, 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 I, 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 If I remember correctly, that is... I think that's the, the wolf one, I think. No, 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 Tabakwe is the crazy jackal. Oh, oh, oh yeah, the, the sidekick or something. Um, not really, um, I'm not 100% sure. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Like, I don't know if he's a good guy, but, like... No, but, like, he has the madness, from what I recall. Oh, you gotta be- No! Hmm. This, this has gotta be kidding, Lock. What? What? Mm. Narrator? Narrator, what? Adam, what? I am not making this up. He's narrating this film? What? Why would you do that? <laughs> 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 Hopefully he'll have a good time. <laughs> no, 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 no. Even better. It's narrated by uh, what is it? Whitey? Whitey? That's that's the voice I was doing. Oh yeah, yeah. Tobacco yummy. Some has to prove himself to be great. And he gets the fire to go scare off here, God. And then there was that great scene where I know everybody is singing vocally song about the fact that he's great, despite the fact that he's stepping in the horn village in the wolf clan. Why are you, what are you doing on the answering machine? You're supposed to be going to your message, not reading from the Riddle Street Classic. I'm trying to get on your book here. <laughs> And then Mowgli took the whole, the whole flock and he commanded it to run over Shere Khan till he was flat. He, he, he commanded a bunch of elephants to get revenge on a bunch of villagers. And they trampled and played it until the jungle engulfed all the pen and all the natives were all homeless. <laughs> now I, but I don't know. This is rather sad. I think I'd rather the Disney movie, but I don't know which one. I think I'll go with the new one because Christopher Boyd is a monkey. Actually, I'd rather go with the one that had Jason Scott me in it with a big, fabulous ass. Oh, yeah, he looked like Tommy Wiseau if he did 30 hundred. Push ups and turned into what's his name from Tarzan. You mean a Hawaiian? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and there was also John McLeish, and like, there was also that evil British guy from the Princess Bride, even though he was actually cool in the Princess Bride. Are you Bride. sure you're not talking about Tarzan?